Welcome back to a live pop culture on Deep Program with Carrie Smith. I'm one of your hosts, Carrie, and I, this is a show we usually do live on Wednesday nights. And today we're doing it at a special time on Friday during a, the, the usual Deep Program because it's the return of Mystery Chris. My co host, Mystery Chris, is back. Welcome, sir. I'm back. Wow. You're back. <laughs> How did that happen? Welcome wow. back. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had to take some time off. had some things going on, but uh, it's good to be back. Uh, we, well, everyone missed you in the chat. They were always asking after you. And uh, and I know that I know they missed you as much as me. So I was excited. I'm like, Let's just do this Friday. We'll do it. And, and do it live and just have a grand old time and since you've been gone and we didn't get to do kind of a christmas party or year end or anything you said let's let's do the best worst of 2020 yeah we're only 12 days late that's okay though <laughs> I mean, still fresh though look i am so Everybody say welcome back, welcome back. I, Twelve days late, whatever. I still feel like it's Christmas. I still have trees up. We um, th this is going to be a very mystery Chris focused episode. This is mystery Chris's best and worst of twenty twenty three because I have not had time to put together a list. The, even this morning, I was uh, downstairs trying to finish the studio. We have an electrician knock on wood coming on Sunday. That's the final part. And the little things I was doing this morning, caulking and staining some things. Um, but I've got to get down there because the something's going on. I think it's the storm that's coming. The freeze is about to happen here in Texas. And our Wi-Fi is affected. So last night I did a guest appearance on the Front Porch Conservatives channel, who I love, Brian. If you guys haven't seen that, go check it out. But I felt bad because... Uh, the I felt bad because the Wi-Fi is bad and I was choppy, and also I was supposed to pre-record something yesterday, and that we we ended up canceling it because it was so choppy. So I'm telling you guys now, if I if I go out, Mystery Chris has got it. He's going to continue the show. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to and, turn it off, so I'll just have to be here for like 12 hours until you can get back. Yeah. This is why I've got to get in there by Monday. I have to because the Wi-Fi is not cutting up here anymore. I have to get plugged into the Ethernet. And uh, uh, anyway, apologies. Bear with us if you're hanging out. I see a lot of regulars. Hey, Pirate Tomsky is here. Give it up for Pirate Tomsky. Pirate. And Nerdy Girl. Oh, gee, I'm so excited. Mr. Chris is back. Well, thank you. I was not expecting that. <laughs> but thank you. Do I have echoes for anyone else? The sheep lady says I do. It's I think it's, it's just, just the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Oh, freeze. Yeah, yeah. See? I gotta get downstairs. Okay. Okay. Uh well, let's get started. We'll let Mystery Chris talk so it's not so annoying with me. <laughs> well, you well, wanna sell this up? Yeah, well, let's talk a little bit about an overview of last okay. year because personally for me, last year was the beginning of my change in consumption of entertainment because a lot of these old ips like stuff that we've all been talking about star wars uh, talk to who i've gotten to a point where i just don't care anymore like the apathy has set in i've gone through all those stages of grief that i don't get upset at all this news coming out like i saw if uh doctor who they doctor who's black now and they did some uh special with david Tennant, and apparently <laughs> they both regenerated at the same time but they came out of each other's pelvis or something i just don't <laughs> care i i i don't oh, <laughs> people getting train. upset i'm like i'm over my anger face i just I, i'm done and so i started watching a bunch of old stuff and that's why on my list for movies and for television shows it's going to be um not a large variety in fact i don't even watch that many shows so my list for worst shows or the shows i didn't like very much it's gonna be pretty short but um i watch a bunch of old movies and uh i made a list and i just want to read out a little bit of yeah. this list this isn't a full list but this is just some of the movies i've watched um some of them made in the last few years most of them made decades ago and a lot of people are going to they get upset with me for not having seen a lot of these movies until now. But uh, let me just read it off. Here we go. Okay. Falling Down, Unforgiven, 
Chinatown, The Mist, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Forbidden Planet, Robinson Crusoe on Mars, Rollerball, Raising Arizona, Big Lebowski, LA Confidential, Death of Stalin, What We Do in the Shadows, Office Space, Reanimator, The Day the Earth Stood Still, the original, Christine, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Solaris, the original, which sucked, Solaris, the remake, Trading Places, Battle Beyond the Stars, The Last Starfighter, Ronin, The Artist, Parasite, Hunger Games, Hunger Games Catching Fire, Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 and 2, White Man Can't Jump, Platoon, 1917, Shin Godzilla, Creed 1 and 2, Patriot Games, A Clear and Present Danger, Rocky Balboa, Teen Wolf, The Pink Panther, The Jerk, Plane, Train, and Automobiles, War Games, and then of course the movies we watch for Halloween, Rosemary's Baby, Wicker Man, and Look What Happened to Rosemary's Baby. What? <laughs> Look, this is your list of things yeah. you watch this year. I watched all these movies because I, I just I was so fed up with so much stuff going on because I'm just I'm just tired of it. It's just, the fatigue is set in for a lot of superhero stuff, Star Wars stuff, and it's not just like the woke stuff. Like a lot of these problems we're seeing in Hollywood have been going on prior to the woke stuff being introduced, and I just I got kind of tired with Star Wars. Like the IP has been around for over forty years now, and I feel like everything that's being produced yeah. with Star Wars is just trying to recapture that magic and sometimes it gets close and or i liked andor but overall it's just it just all seems hollow and it's just to me an ip like star wars has just been so overexposed that i'm just i just gotta find other stuff to watch i'm not just going to consume stuff because it has the label of some ip that i've loved since i was a child i'm getting there with star trek i will admit i still do hate watch a little bit of star trek but even then the apathy is kind of setting in like unfortunately, I'm gonna watch season five of Discovery. Don't don't ask me why. But outside of that, I'm kind of done with hate watching a lot of stuff. Can you just read the list again? Because I didn't catch it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carrie. <laughs> but yeah, uh, people I've... like because a lot of people have been telling me like some of these movies, like The Big Lebowski. Like every time I told people I'd never seen that, they're like, "What? You never seen it?" And I was like, "No." So I finally watched it. And I, I liked it a lot. So, yeah, movies like that and uh, Office Space was another one people were shocked I had never seen. And uh, it's great. Falling Down, yep. You should do a review of that, Carrie. I, I think you said you haven't seen it. No, I've seen it. It's oh, you did see it. Okay. Time. I should watch it again. I did watch Planes, Trains, and Automobiles again. This year. That was great. Mm -hmm. And LA Confidential, I watched that again. Anthony had never seen it. That was great. Yeah, that's great. Although I feel weird, like, seeing Kevin Spacey in movies. Like, I feel guilty. Like, I'm, I'm enjoying his performance, but he's a horrible person. Like, <laughs> should I be enjoying this? Okay. Um, should we get into your list then? For yeah, let's get into it. So, um, let's start with TV shows. And so, and to remind everyone, these are just my favorite and ones I didn't like. I'm not saying these are the best or worst, objectively speaking. Okay. Okay. So I only have three of these because I didn't even watch that many shows. It's a it's a big commitment spending like ten hours watching a show a year. So, um, let let's start. Bottom shows of twenty twenty three. Is it up? Um, it's a little slow on my side. I'm still oh, waiting. Gosh. I know it's gonna be. Oh gosh, you guys! Ay, ay, ay. I might have to start talking about I'm it like anyway. I'm like totally frozen. <laughs> oh no! Oh man! Okay, turn uh, off the cam. Hold on, let me turn off my cam. <laughs> uh oh, she turned off herself. That's not good. We we'll assume she'll be back. Oh, there it is. Well. That's up, so I don't know if she can hear me, but so this is uh Bel Air. So this is the dr dramatized version of Fresh Prince of Bel Air. We actually talked about this on one of our first episodes. Oh, you can hear it. good. So we we actually talked about this on one of our first episodes of pop culture. And here's the thing: this movie or this show isn't terrible. I don't hate it, but I do hate myself for still watching it because it's got some ridiculous storylines in it but there's something about it that keeps making me come back to it and keep watching it so like 
uh, Jeffrey, who's the butler on the uh, far left, he is a literal gangster. Uh, Ashley, who's right behind Will in the center, uh, she's gay now. And Carlton still has a cocaine addiction. And it's it's kind of a trashy drama, but I can't stop watching it. And so that's why I put this on here. It's like, I'm not saying uh, it's something people should watch. It's still not good, but if you want to watch something trashy, then I, I think you enjoy, you would enjoy it in that regard. But uh, the casting, I must say, despite what they did with some of these characters, uh, is pretty good. The guy in the middle, I don't know his name, but he actually does pretty as good as a job you can as Will Smith. I mean, the real Will Smith, uh, despite what happened last year. <laughs> despite it, he is, and certainly back in the 90s, was one of the most charismatic actors on TV and in movies. And there's just no replacing that. But he does as good a job as you can. But, yep, that's Bel Air. So uh, I don't know if you could talk, Carrie, if, if you want to talk. Yeah. This again is your worst list, right? This is the worst, yes. <laughs> okay. You did say some nice things, some okay things about it. Yeah, it's but it's still not good. It, it's just trashy, and I, I enjoy it for trashy reasons. And so uh, we can go to the next one. I did. I don't have a lot the next to say. One. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> This next one shouldn't be too much a surprise to people who have uh, listened to our show for a while. You want to? Oh, the anticipation you, is is. This 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 wife is terrible. <laughs> I feel so bad. Texas buddy was like this. I, is, <laughs> if you disappear, like, no time. <laughs> it might change. If you disappear and then come back, because that's what happened last time. Once you oh. disappeared, it showed up, and then that's fine. Let's see. Three, two, one. Any moment now. I still, uh, ay, ay, ay. still not moving. There we go. All right. So you can come back, Carrie. Uh, so uh, this one is Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Now, I have so much to say about this. I'm, I'm trying to keep it short. Hey, Ryan. So Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Trying to think where to start because there's so many things I want to say. Let's start visually. So visually, Star Trek Station Worlds, in its own right, it looks nice. It has a nice aesthetic. But as somebody who was attracted to Star Trek since I was a kid, and the first reason why I love Star Trek, why I started getting into it, was because of the aesthetic and seeing the evolution of uh, the technology in there. And Strange New Worlds doesn't keep that evolution of technology consistent. And it's supposed to take place 10 years before, about 10 years before Captain Kirk takes control of the Enterprise. And uh, the people doing it are not staying faithful to what Star Trek is. I call this Star Trek the TikTok generation because everything written about it is made to appeal to a younger generation. And the uh, way the characters talk, the the dialogue, it's very reminiscent of Josh Whedon. Josh Whedon's kind of ruined a lot of movies and television shows these days simply because so many writers are trying to emulate the way that uh, he writes his dialogue. And it doesn't work for Star Trek at all. And Star Trek in this particular season, the second season, uh, tried to do a lot of things that would appeal to people who typically didn't watch Star Trek. So they did a crossover with Lower Decks. Lower Decks is the animated show doing a crossover. It makes absolutely no sense because Lower Decks clearly doesn't take place in the same universe. They're constantly referencing things that happen. They're breaking the fourth wall. It makes no sense. Uh, they also did another episode of Strange Worlds where they did a musical episode. And this was one of the worst things I've ever seen with Star Trek. I'm not even opposed necessarily to having a musical episode in Star Trek. It was the way it was done that made no sense. They had an anomaly that supposedly caused it all the uh, crew members to not only sing songs, but also do choreographed dances, which made no sense. But if you want to do something, a musical in Star Trek, let's put it this way. Imagine if Star Trek Voyager, for those who watch Star Trek Voyager, if Star Trek Voyager did a musical episode, how would they do it? 
most likely they'd have an episode where say Tom Paris went to the hollow deck and he was doing running a hollow program that was a musical and say it malfunctioned and these characters hollow deck characters who were singing were becoming violent and they were threatening to kill the crew members trapped in the holodeck if they didn't sing along with these songs and so that would force the characters to improvise uh, songs and to sing in order to keep themselves alive that would have made sense and would have worked better in the context of star trek but doing this uh, is just another sign that the people making star trek just don't fully understand or fully care about what star trek is and what we as long-term star trek fans love about star trek they're continuously trying to make it like other things like i said with josh whedon doing the uh, buffy the vampire slayer musical it just it does not work and unfortunately i think this is the future of star trek i've i've kind of getting to a point where i'm just accepting it and listen i know there are people who enjoy this show and that's fine i have friends that love this show but it's just not what star trek was either original or in the berman era so here's the third one. Uh, this is The Mandalorian. Uh, this one <laughs> was... Uh, Mandalorian is not that great of a show to begin with. The first two seasons were very similar to one another. Mandalorian goes someplace, has to uh, complete some kind of task, and then he goes some other place, has to complete another task. It was very repetitive. And this season was similar to that, except worse. Uh, they couldn't make up their mind who they wanted to concentrate on, whether they wanted to concentrate on the Mandalorian himself or on Bo-Katan's character. It, uh, there was just constant stuff being thrown at the camera, constant special effects that just wasn't really adding to the overall story. It was meandering the whole time and wasn't really getting to a point. And so I put this as the number one uh, show that I did not enjoy this this year or last year. And I'm not going to watch any more of The Mandalorian. I'm done. Like, if they make a fourth season, which I think they are. I'm just, I'm out. I'm done. It's over. So, Carrie, you got anything to say? Uh, I'm back. I dropped out for a second. So, no, no I don't have anything to say. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, didn't you watch some of The Mandalorian? Am I just making that memory up? No, I, I didn't watch it. I, okay. I'm familiar with what happened with uh, Gina Carano, the actress, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, that wasn't my bag. Yeah. So that was the worst. So we could go to the best. Okay. And again, I didn't watch too many shows this year. And so that was a little bit of a struggle trying to find shows that fit both best and worst. Can you see but, that? Yes. I can. Oh, good. The internet's a little bit better now. Okay. Yeah, you're not choppy. That's good. So for All Men Can, the, the fourth season... I actually didn't finish watching this yet. I'm still wait, wait. Like, let's clarify. Episodes. This is your best of best the yes. whole year. Okay, okay. Let's go. And so I, I put this here because you know I liked what I saw so far. I know the uh, fourth season completed yesterday. I don't know if it went to crap or not, but um, this show is a alternate history show in which the um, Russians land on the moon first, and that causes uh, changes throughout history, like certain people become. Uh, president or prime minister in various countries changes uh, for things happening socially in America and in Russia. And the show is, I, I enjoy it. It can be a little too much at times in terms of melodramatic. Um, uh, but overall, I, I like the show. It, it is a show produced by Ronald Moore, who produced the Battlestar Galactica remake and was a writer on the Space Nine and Next Generation. And so some of that DNA in it from him. Uh, it is a show I would say is progressive. I wouldn't say it's woke. I would say it's progressive simply because of the storylines. Uh, they have there's there was storyline two storylines last season of two characters that were closeted gays, which is just a very tired storyline overall. But the storyline they did in the first season, I was like, okay, I don't mind that. But when they continue to go back to that, well, it gets a little tiring. But uh, all the characters, regardless of their identity, I think have strengths and flaws. And that's why I won't say it's, you know, woke, but I will say it, it is progressive. So just want to say a quick thank you to Super Base, who just gifted five D program with Carrie Smith memberships. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think, yeah, Z Highness got one of those. Thank you for the membership. Thank you so much. 
Okay. Next one. Next one. Is my audio better now? It is a lot better. Good. Okay. Uh, so this is Silo. So this was an Apple uh, TV show based on a book series that I have not read and uh, stars Rebecca Ferguson. It's kind of hot. Uh, but it was a pretty good show. It's about a group of um, thousands of people who live in an abandoned missile silo that's basically been turned into a city and they can't go above ground uh, because they would die. And of course, you know, if you just know the premise or see the, the trailer, you know, there's going to be some kind of twist and I won't ruin the twist, of course, but that twist did uh, surprise me. I didn't I didn't predict that. And so that was a pleasant surprise that the writers were able to do something that, you know, wasn't predictable. Uh, but it was a good show. It dragged a little bit in the middle. Uh, common, you can see uh, at the bottom uh, left and um, uh, I'm a blank in Tim Robbins uh, up top. Um, their performance wasn't great. It's a little <laughs> stilted, a little dry. But uh, overall, I enjoyed the show. And so look forward to the second season. I'm going next one. Please. I never even heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Not a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, so I have Righteous Gemstones as the third one. <gasps> okay. I watched a couple episodes of this one. I like it. What did you one. think? I liked, I liked it too. It. I, I, this is the third season. Third season is uh, was an improvement over the second season. I think the second season was hampered because it was written during the COVID uh, lockdown stuff, and uh, it was it was a little underwhelming. But this season got back on track. And uh, Righteous Gemstones, for people who aren't aware of that, is uh, about a group of televangelists, a family of televangelists. Uh, the three kids are pretty really spoiled and kind of awful people. And this show. <laughs> One of them is I played by Danny McBride. Danny McBride, yeah. But this show, I think it 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 makes fun of televangelists and like hypocritical Christians, but it does have some Christians in there that do take their faith seriously because Hollywood is obsessed with highlighting Christian hypocrisy because so often in movies and television shows, you see Christians who don't take their faith seriously or just really crazy and cringe and weird. You don't see a lot of them who are just like genuine good people. There's nothing wrong with them. They just have strong faith. But in the show, it, it's a mix. The the kids, yes, they they don't particularly take their faith seriously. But the dad, played by John Goodman, and the uh, wife, his wife, who died prior to the events of season one, do take the faith seriously. So I don't think it's uh, completely cynical in that regard <laughs> because we're so used to seeing these cynical storylines in there. But this third season uh, was very good. They did have a storyline um, centering around militias, which I'm not. When I, I'm not opposed to having storylines with with malicious, but typically with Hollywood does malicious stuff, they're always like crazy, like anti-government. Like who would be against the government? Like that's so crazy. <laughs> like, I, I remember watching like some episode. I rewatched it recently of Star Trek Voyager, where they went back to 1996, and one of the crew members gets captured by this. Um, uh, redneck militia guy and he like keeps her in a basement and he's like yeah the government new world order is gonna take over and they're gonna, gonna force us to do all this stuff and like at that time everyone's like oh yeah that's that's insane but like after the last few years it's like okay all these storylines about crazy militias that are preparing for like the government to become completely authoritarian like that's not crazy anymore <laughs> so like lies don't kind of work anymore but having said that, I did still enjoy it in this show. Steve Zahn plays uh, the leader of this uh, militia, and uh, it was it was a fun season. What do you, you said? You oh, never mind. You went to what? No, oh, you already said you you liked it. But did you have any other thoughts about? No, because I'm about not. It? I I didn't even finish the first season, so I okay. liked it, but clearly not enough to stay engaged over okay. other things. I'll probably come back to it. I really enjoyed Danny McBride. I think he's hilarious, and he, you know, I'm from the South. I like Southern comedians, um, and I like poking. I like I like something that pokes fun at con artists and these sort of over the top extravagant. Uh, con artists who are taking advantage of Christianity is it's appealing to me. I mean, it's an interesting subject matter and then it, you know, they have great actors and it's funny. So that's why I liked about it. Okay. Excellent. All right. If we could go to uh, number two on the list, drum roll uh, foundation. Uh, so I'm a big fan of foundation trilogy by Isaac Asimov. 
Uh, the first season of Foundation came out a couple of years ago, which was very disappointing. I liked the first episode, but after that, um, it became very, um, what do you call it, non-compelling, I guess. Uh, and they had a lot of uh, bad characters. The, the characters, the, the, the actors they chose for some of these characters were poor, poor actors. But this season was a bit of a rebound, much better than the first season. Not perfect, um, but they managed to make the story a bit more compelling um, they, they made a lot of changes from the book, and that's understandable that you'd have to because you can't adapt the book the way it's written for screen. It's just impossible. But some of the changes they made, like with the Emperor, you can see in the middle, Lee Pace, who's an excellent actor. He actually played, which I'm call it, in um, Guardians of the Galaxy, the bad guy Ronan, I think was the name. Uh, he's excellent as the Emperor. And his storyline, while not being true to the book, works very well for this TV show. He, he is, I'd say, the most compelling um, story and character um, in this show, and I'm hoping they'll continue uh, to build on that. But uh, the show overall, um, the second season, I should say, uh, was very good, and so people are looking for other sci-fi stuff to watch. Um, I recommend watching it. First season, like I said, disappointment, but once you get second season, it gets a lot better. We can go number one. Should be surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise. What was it going to be? I wonder. Oh. <laughs> so I put Star Trek. And what a difference a year makes with this. Because if you remember last year, my worst show, number one worst show, was the second season of Picard. Yeah. I still stand by. Yeah. First two seasons were awful. <laughs> but this was a pleasant rebound. And this show wasn't perfect. You know, this this wasn't Star Trek of old. Like if if you haven't seen this and you're expecting it to be season eight of Star Trek Next Generation, you're going to be disappointed. But if you expect this to be a good version of one of the Next Generation movies, which I guess is maybe not saying too much, uh, then you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, the thing I loved about the show was what they did with the characters. There were several emotional moments in the show that actually made me emotion, made me feel something that nothing in any of the newer Star Trek, the Alex Kurtzman, J.J. Abrams stuff, nothing in these new shows other than this last season, Picard, made me feel anything for any of the characters. Like, I never felt emotion. I didn't care about any of these characters. But in the third season, there were several moments that made me a little emotional, almost, almost made me get a little teary-eyed. One, one particular uh, moment when I won't spoil. But I think because of the strength of these character moments, that's why I elevate it to number one. Yes, this overall plot of the season has holes in it there are there's some stuff in there that was member berries that i i didn't like or appreciate putting in there uh i still have a problem with the dark lighting of uh, some of the ships in there and uh, there's some other little things but overall uh because they managed to send off the next generation crew um in a proper manner in my my opinion uh, especially considering what happened after uh, or what happened during Star Trek Nemesis. If you're a Star Trek fan, you saw Star Trek Nemesis. Uh, that was a very, very terrible movie. I remember walking out of theater, seeing that movie and feeling like I just saw Star Trek die. It felt like I was coming out of funeral. And so it was very nice to have these characters back and to show these characters as having changed that the 20 years that's passed by has changed them in a manner that is realistic and still true to these characters. And so because of the, the work Terry Metalis did uh, on the show, uh, I put this as uh, number one, my, my favorite show for 2023. That's quite a comeback for you. I know it's crazy. So, but like I said, I think this that uh, is the last we're going to see of like good, as good as it's going to get Star Trek. Uh, Strange New Worlds is going to be the future because as much as I don't really care for Strange New Worlds, it does appear to be very popular with uh, a lot of people. And I think the studio seeing that and saying, hey, we got something here. Let's just continue to make uh, Star Trek in the vein of Strange New Worlds, which I don't get it. I mean, it's it's. Slightly above Star Trek Discovery, I guess that's a good thing, but it, it's it's not as smart, not as brainy, uh, it's not as deep. It doesn't really delve into the depths of what uh, Star Trek in the past has done. You know, it's like the the last episode of uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation. Um, there's a scene in there that always gets me, and to me, it sums up what Star Trek is about. At the very end of All Good Things. Um, Q, which is all powerful being, puts Picard and the crew through a test and Picard solves the problem and Q gives a speech to him and he says to him, 
the journey that humanity is on is not about uh, mapping stars and exploring uh, nebula. It's about charting the unknown possibilities of human existence. And that's something that gives me goosebumps because to me that summarizes what Star Trek is. Star Trek to me has always been something that made the impossible seem possible. You know, it's about entertaining the idea of achieving the impossible. And that's ultimately what drives progress. That's what drives technological process, uh, progress. I mean, think about how much uh, pieces of technology we have today that if you were to take back 500 years ago, show people, they would think you're a, a witch. Like if you had a, like a simple <laughs> iPod or iPhone and played music from it, they think you're like you, you're summoning the devil and they murder you. And so <laughs> I I just love the ethos of the, the Star Trek stuff and nothing really in the newer Star Trek stuff has come close to the line that I just mentioned from Next Generation. Like I, I th there's just not much profound statements about human existence being made in the new Star Trek. And it's a shame. But, you know, if people are enjoying it, then, hey, whatever. It's a lot of bad things going on in the world. So if you're able to find some enjoyment out of this stuff, then knock yourself out. Cool. Okay, yeah. should we do your your worst and best of film in 2023? Yes. Let's do it. I think you'll probably, you've probably seen some of these. You might. We start on the bottom so we can finish on the top. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, bottom movies of 2023. So next one, please. So Hunting in Venice. Now, this wasn't a bad movie. It was just disappointing. Like, I'm a big fan of these movies, the Perot movies, the Agatha Christie uh, movies about these murder mysteries. And uh, this movie, I love the atmosphere of it. Um, I predicted who the murderer was, but the way they did it, I was like, I don't know about that. So, but uh, again, not a bad movie. I didn't see all too many new movies. That's why I put this number five, but it was just a bit disappointing for me. So have you seen any of these movies, Carrie? I've not seen the haunting of Venice. No, I have no, okay. what's you, it about? So you didn't see the other ones? Uh, like uh, what's the I first one? Murder on the Orient, oh. Murder of the Orient Express. No, I haven't. Okay, or Murder on the Nile, I think that's the second one. But yeah, you might enjoy him, you know. I, and I'm Jordan. Yeah, there's murder mystery type things. He's yeah. a detective that gets brought in to solve these murders. And so the fun of you as a viewer is trying to put together clues and, and decide who did it. So usually I, I got the, I, I, I knew who the, in the first movie, I, I predicted who was the murderer there. Second one, uh, they got me. I didn't predict that, but this one I did, so. But anyway, next one. Indiana oh. Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So <laughs> this movie, it wasn't the worst thing, but it wasn't good. Like this movie is a movie that one shouldn't have been made, but this movie is better than Kingdom of a Crystal Skull, <laughs> which is not saying much. The previous Indiana Jones movie that came out, this movie, like nothing in this movie made me as upset as... Shia LaBeouf swinging from vines with a bunch of monkeys in the last one or Indiana Jones jumping into a abandoned refrigerator uh, before a nuclear bomb goes off and surviving it like that that made me like physically like angry like I could I was at the air watching that I couldn't believe I was seeing I was like this has to be George Lucas's idea <laughs> awful and so this movie while not having anything quite as upsetting as that in it it's pretty boring overall and it's just not that compelling. Phoebe Waller Bridge, is that her name? She's a bit annoying in a little bit, but uh, she wasn't as bad as I thought she was going to be. Because I thought she I was liked her be in Fleabag. Have okay. you ever seen Fleabag? No, I've never watched it. Okay. That was pretty good. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and I saw some people talking about, like, apparently there are rumors that they're, they originally this film was going to have short round in it. And I was like, that would have been so much better than what they got here. But uh, yeah, overall, while not a terrible movie, like as terrible as the last one, it's just not a very entertaining film. And I don't really recommend people waste time on it. You know, Harrison Ford is 80 years old. He shouldn't have been in this movie. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> it it's like, I know a lot of people are complaining about like when they're doing this character, but I'm like, it's not really realistic for an 80 year old man to be knocking out 35 year old men like he did when he was like, you know, 40 in the original or something. So no, it's, it's, I can't really suspend my disbelief with that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's like when you see a, a woman, the, the way they keep replacing all these 
you know, characters with women and making them female. And then they're just sort of inexplicably stronger than the men they're fighting in the action films and stuff like what? Oh yeah. No. We'll get to that. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, we go to the next one. Flash. Oh, so this one, again, this movie, I didn't think was like as bad as people saying, but it, it still wasn't good. And it's just, it, it's, smacked of despa desperation by dc taking flash and putting it with michael keaton's batman which is basically the only reason why i saw it and that was the marketing of this film was trying to get people who have nostalgia for michael keaton's batman to go see this movie and it didn't work apparently because the movie bombed and it, but it, it was nice seeing michael keaton in there it was a little silly seeing a, a seven-year-old michael keaton beat up a bunch of guys and be more flexible than he ever was in the original suit but I, I did, while I did enjoy seeing him, I, it, the whole movie just came out, was very uh, messy and, and sloppy and just didn't, it didn't jive together. Ezra Miller, I wasn't as annoyed by him as I thought I was going to be in there. He, there were some parts, but he wasn't that bad. The chick played Supergirl. She wasn't as annoying as I thought she was going to be because I thought she was going to be pretty girl bossy and it wasn't quite as much as that, but um, I think this movie is pretty much like uh, Michael Shannon summed it up <laughs> with Michael Shannon, who plays General Zod and Man of Steel. He's also in this movie. Uh, he said he at first he was so so about coming back to reprise his role in this movie because uh, after reading a script, he was thinking about the multiverse. He's like, this multiverse stuff seems like little kids playing with toys and exactly what it is, basically just mixing these things. And if this movie had done a multiverse of say, I don't know, Michael Keaton's Batman, Christopher Reeve's Superman, um, I forget the guy who played the Flash from the '90s sitcom or not sitcom television show, and mm -hmm. um, maybe uh, Linda Carter's Wonder Woman, that'd be kind of uh, cool because those superheroes, you know, existed around the same era. That'd be kind of cool crossover. You'd actually have to, you would obviously have to do some de aging, and obviously Christopher Reeve being dead, you'd have to get someone who looked like him or, or do some kind of deep fake or something. But that would have made more sense than combining the modern DC superheroes with, you know, Batman from Tim Burton's universe, which existed by itself. So overall, just not, not a good, good movie, but not as bad as I think a lot of people are saying. I've heard yeah. nothing but bad things about these previous two. That's why I didn't bother. I didn't watch Indiana Jones or The Flash because everyone I respect and trust, including you, was like, man, no. <laughs> yeah, don't don't waste your time on it. It wasn't worth it. Like, honestly, if I go back, I would just like maybe look online for scenes with Michael Keaton in it and just watch those. But it's not worth it. Uh, Super Base says, if someone gives five memberships, I'll match it. Wow. Thank you, Super Base. Oh. There you go. That putting that out there. Um, let's see. Okay, I've got your next one here. Now I did see this one, as you know. Yeah. So I think you'd have a lot to say because I don't think I ever got your your update on it. Because uh, uh, this was a uh, movie that uh, I hated. I still hate it. <laughs> Wait. But... <laughs> tell me what it is for anybody who's just listening. Oh, this, this is Barbie. Is... <laughs> yeah. So. Like, so when I first watched it, I thought this was like one of the most woke, woke movies I, I'd ever seen. Um, <laughs> but as I mentioned when, well, I mentioned like when we, when I talked about this on a previous episode, I don't want to read woke to movies where it doesn't exist. I do think there are people on our side that have become so obsessed with it that they start seeing it in places that it's not. I never want to be like that. And so I'm always looking for uh, contrarian opinions, people who are saying things different than mine to, to try to test uh, my belief of a certain you know movie being quote unquote woke, and I watched some videos of various people, um, like uh, uh, Cameron Pasha, who's been on the show, uh, Ethan Van yeah. Skyver. They they both love this movie. Yeah. Both of them say this movie isn't woke and that it's anti woke. I don't quite think that, but I do to the point. I do think that it is a little bit more self conscious about woke stuff. While I'll give them, they do kind of poke fun at woke stuff, particularly with America Ferrera's daughter in this. Mm -hmm. I still think it's very feminist movie, obviously. I mean, it's a Barbie movie that's baked in the cake. And so I still think it's very feminist. But it, I will say it, it is odd and interesting how many people, one, commented on this movie. A lot of men, particularly myself included, watched the movie and commented, like, just how many people were talking about this movie when it came out. It was crazy. But also seeing the people on our side 
not just on the pop culture side, but even on a political side, uh, having such diverse opinions. You know, some people like absolutely hated most woke things ever. Other people thought this movie was accidentally based. You know, I know Sargon and Lotus Eaters guys thought this was uh, accidentally based accidentally because, based, of, uh, because yeah. of Kin. Yeah. And, and there's some people, like I just mentioned, who thought this movie is actually anti woke. And I was like, it's just so bizarre how many people have different readings of this one movie, such completely different readings from people who normally have a, a consensus on movies being you know woke and pushing ideology and so it's really amazing but i know you said you know we talked originally when you saw it and you hated the movie but i wasn't sure if your views of it changed at all like where are you at with this movie yeah i don't know if i would say hate i i definitely think it was woke uh and and that i'm not reading you know something into it that's not there uh it was fun though see i've i have contradictory opinions in some ways, because sometimes people, if they disagree with the message or whatever, then they can't enjoy it. Well, I'm not one of those people. I can still enjoy certain things about it. It was a fun movie. I understand why people, women, were taking their girlfriends and going to see it. Um, I like the dance scenes. I like the color. Like I can enjoy that, all of that stuff, the fun of it, the, the spectacle of it, the, the opulence of it in terms of visually, it was... It was beautiful and it was fun mm -hmm. and and the dance numbers were fun but in terms of message i think it was woke but i also think it was all over the place and schizophrenic <laughs> and yes. that's why a lot of people thought it was anti-woke because it was so schizophrenic and yes. it didn't there were things that did not make sense like lots of things yes. where yeah where the where they idea. were well yeah where you know um first of all they show things that aren't even true which i think amounts to propaganda where you're trying to present something in a biased way to af affect what young women think about the world. And so, for example, they show the Mattel board and it's all men. And that's not true. That's not the way it is. So why lie and present it that way? Because the Mattel board is a real thing that exists. So why lie? And and I know I know I have a friend whose teenage daughter who went to see it with her teenage daughter and her teenage daughter left there saying, well, that's the way the world is, mom. It's all run by men. It's all controlled by men. It's like, wow, uh, if that's what teenage girls are walking away from this film with, that message, then I don't I don't like that at all. Yeah. Uh, I don't like you presenting something fake like that, that, you know, the world is a patriarchy controlled by men. And uh, so much so that, the, that that you have to skew, you have to, you have to falsify reality and show the Battelle board as being all men when it's not. Okay, the other thing is, it didn't make sense, like the, the character motivations mm -hmm. and everything. And yes, even for a fun movie, I want it to make sense, unless it's unless the the kind of film that it is, it's not supposed to, but but this was supposed to. So so things like uh, Will Ferrell's character, you know, the head of Mattel, uh, why, he would just switch motivations just randomly. It'd be <laughs> like, okay, he wants he wants the Ken doll to succeed, now he wants Ken doll to fail, or he wants Barbie to succeed, now he wants her to fail. It doesn't make any sense. It just kept switching and um and i think uh uh it it just didn't know it didn't know what it was at the end of the day yeah. what you know it didn't even know is it a movie for little girls or not like there were some defenses of this movie i saw where they said well it's for little girls and that's why such and such doesn't make sense or that's why such and such is this way is because it's for kids but then on the other hand i would see people saying well, no, it's not for kids. So you can't judge the sexualization of, you know, there's one character who's sort of supposedly gay and there's a sexual innuendo and, and, you know, you can't, you can't judge the sexual jokes and stuff because this is, this is for adults. It's not for kids. I'm like, okay, well, which is it? Um, you're clearly marketing it to little kids because all the previews at the movie theater are for little kids. So it, again i just don't think it knew what it what it was supposed to be and in terms of message i didn't like at the end the message for ken is terrible the message for barbie and ken is basically a destruction of the traditional family and of you know finding someone to settle down with and create a family with at the end it sort of lifts up this female empowerment idea where barbie's going out in the world to be herself and be empowered and and ken the the way they present Ken is just um, this complete cuck simp, who then at the end learns to be a cuck simp alone, 
And, <laughs> I, you know, and he goes through this, um, what's, I guess, supposed to be a toxic masculinity phase, which is hilarious. I still, I found humor in it. I did. There were really funny moments. Ken was hilarious. Brad was hilarious. But, uh, but in terms of message, I didn't like it. No, I think, if, I think if little girls saw this, they're going to leave that theater like my friend's teenager did with the idea that yes it's it's uh it's pointing out what what is accurate and true in the world which is that this is a patriarchy and yeah. i i didn't like that about it so well and to your point about being schizophrenic i totally agree with it and that was one of the other reasons why i did not like this movie because the rules that they established how this universe works wasn't maintained throughout that the movie because mm -hmm. barbie from beginning from what i the way i read it that barbie is the physical manifestation of this idealized standard of adulthood that America Ferreira's character had since she was a child. And now that she's gotten to middle age, she's starting to have a midlife crisis, an existential crisis. And she's really questioning you know, where she's at in life because her life does not mirror that of what she imagined it would be when she was a little girl playing with Barbie. And so it made sense for Barbie to come into the real world, even though she wasn't actually there in the real world, that you know, it would be basically going on in America Ferrer's head and how she's working out dealing with this midlife crisis. And so, from that, I'd be I was like, okay, I'm on board with that. But it didn't keep it consistent because, like you said, with Will Ferrell stuff, like stuff that would happen in the real world was obviously not happening in the real world because it was too fantastical. Like you said, with all the board members of Mattel being men and then them going on this chase of barbie and these cubicle things which obviously wasn't in the real world it's like I, i'm not sure what's happening where is this supposed to take place it's just it, it lost it for me and so like when i initially tweeted out about this movie i compared it to drop dead fred and i love drop dead fred i, I love I this, drop dead fred i call this <laughs> yeah. the feminist version of drop dead fred but the thing <laughs> i loved about drop dead fred and one of the deeper things about it was that drop dead fred was this manifestation of um Phoebe Cates' character of uh, basically a strong male in her, her life. I know her dad was in, in her life, but her dad leaves her mom. And so uh, Drop Dead Fred is basically everything that Phoebe Cates as little girl isn't. He can stand up to her emotionally abusive mother. He's funny. You know, he's confident. Uh, he's big. So all these things that she wish she was is reflected in, in Drop Dead Fred. And so seeing Drop Dead Fred in the movie, everything that plays out makes sense. And I know there's questions of whether Drop Dead Fred actually exists in the real world or not, or she's just like really crazy. But it, it that seemed more logical. It did a better yes. job in maintaining the rules of, of that universe. The rules of the than, universe, yes. Yeah, than Barbie. And so, and this was another point I forgot to make about Strange New Worlds. Sorry to go back to Star Trek. But uh, when I was talking about the uh, musical episode, like one of the reasons why I didn't like that so much was that it did the rules of star trek universe because if you have a musical like if you're watching uh, i don't know let's just say the Wiz because i like the Wiz. that's like one of the only uh it, well she already went to the other one no hold on <laughs> but the reasons why i like um uh or the Wiz and stuff like that um these musicals is because they maintain the rules to the way these universe works that mm -hmm. you accept that people spontaneously break out the song and dance whereas in star trek it doesn't make sense. You can't introduce those rules into a universe that's never operated in that fashion. It just it doesn't jive. And I actually tweeted out. I was I was like, how can people like this Strange New Worlds uh, episode where they sing and dance and hate uh, Batman and Robin? The, remember the film Batman and Robin came out in the 90s? Yeah. I tweeted that out not knowing or forgetting really that Akira uh, Gozman who does, he's a showrunner of Strange New Worlds, also was the main writer of Batman and Robin. Because <laughs> to me, it was the same thing. Because like Tim Burton made Batman more serious in the mind of the public. I know in the comic book, Batman was coming more serious. But when ben, Tim Burton did Batman 89, like the last live action iteration of Batman was Adam West. And so in the mind of the public, they had this goofy, campy uh, idea of what Batman was, assuming they weren't reading the comics. But once, you know, it became serious in the movies, you couldn't really go back to a more goofy or campy stuff. It didn't work anymore. And that's a big reason why uh, those Joel Schumacher movies aren't remembered very well these days. And so anyway, sorry to go off, off the path. But. No, no, uh, I, I love it. Okay, let me see. I'm trying and this to is find the last here. one. Uh, 
Hold on. I think that that super chat uh, predicted something. <laughs> okay, before we do the last one, let me just say, ah, uh, come back here. Let me just put this up on the screen. Uh, Superbase started off the show by gifting five D program memberships, which was awesome. Thank you. And says, hail to the fellowship. Cheers. And then made a challenge. And so Pirate Tomsky gifted five memberships. Thank you. And says, get on it. Thank you for starting off the new year, <laughs> guys. Um, I appreciate it truly with all the studio updates that we're doing. It's about to be a very expensive month because we're about to get a really great camera. You and those who are tired of the tech problems will be happy to know that. <laughs> so, so I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for the supporting the show. Superbase gave five more D program memberships. Wow, dude. Thanks a lot. And then five more memberships. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So it's like 15, I think. <laughs> Plus five that Pirate gave. So you guys grab those memberships up and thank you to Superbase and thank you to Pirate Tom C. Um, ADL 1992 says i have mice feelings about barbie do you mean mixed feelings or mice <laughs> you have mice feelings <laughs> or nice feelings like mice, so nice? Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> i was gonna say i don't like mice so i'm assuming that's bad bad <laughs> mice feelings okay <laughs> and uh adl 1992 thank you again sir for another super chat for dollar 99 says i have a lot of thoughts about greta gerwig She's uh, doing the new Snow White film, and I know a lot of people are expecting that to be pretty feminist and woke and stuff. And if it, it turns out to be that way, like, will some people revise what Barbie is? Because she had a hand in writing the film, and some people were saying, like, she's, like, accidentally or, or intentionally based. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you're reading No, a little I definitely don't think she's intentionally based. No, I don't buy that. Uh, ADL 1982 says, yeah, I meant mixed mixed feelings. Thank you. Um, yeah, she just knowing what she's done previously, I'm like, mm, I don't, I don't but I did that. like the production design, like you were talking earlier, yes. it did look nice. I will say that's why I put this at number two, even though I hate most of it. I, the production design was really cool, it reminded me of a pink version of Pee Wee's Playhouse. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a good way to put it. And I love Pee Wee's Playhouse. Okay, let's yeah. continue with Mr. Chris's uh, worst films of 2023. Uh so Peter Pan and Wendy. I honestly don't even remember much of this film because I hated it so much. I only watched it once and it's just whatever. So I I despite never having read Peter Pan, uh the book, I, I, I love watching the movies because I've watched numerous movies over the years and I love seeing different interpretations. My favorite is Hook. Like the mm -hmm. you know, we just you just put up a a a chat earlier that, that said Hook was the best. I agree. Um and I actually, I know I'm in the minority, but I actually like the last one that came out. I think it's called Pan. I know a lot of people hated it and bombed stuff. I actually kind of liked it. <laughs> but this movie was awful. It was, I, I couldn't get over the visuals. Like, it was so drab. Even looking at this poster, like, is this a world you want to go into? Is this an inviting, wonderful, magical world that you associate with Neverland and Peter Pan? Like the entire film looks like this. It's just completely drab. The locations are ugly. Like they, <laughs> this movie really should have just been called Wendy because they <laughs> wanted to obviously make her the main character. They give her so much, you know, authority in doing things and, you know, she's going to rescue herself and all these other things. It's such a, a bad, bad movie. And it's so, I want to, I would say yeah, I was disappointed, but I'm not because it's Disney. And so, I'm not really too surprised by it, but I'm still in a way a little disappointed because even story, like story wise, I expect it to be a mess, which it was. But from visual standpoint, I would have expected better from Disney because there's still a lot of talented artists working for Disney and, and for Marvel. And I just mm -hmm. would expect it to, to do something that was uh, more fun. Did. That was, you know, yeah, more childlike. That, These that actors really placing the imagination. Boring. Yeah, well, is that they possible? Are. They look boring in the art, even. I'm like, hmm. I don't know who these actors are, but they look boring. Yeah, everything about this film is boring. So far, <laughs> um, nothing give it up about this at all. For two sisters and some yarn swinging in, one of our mods says, "I can't stay, but I'm just swinging in to say hello and welcome back to Mystery Chris." Well, thank you, two sisters. 
Good to see you. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So well, that was worth. Yeah. Now we get yeah. to get to get to get to some good stuff. We're gonna end out. Uh oh. Uh, your back list. Up. Why? Oh, you're, you're. Oh, because you were showing, showing this. <laughs> oh, hold on. Let's see. The top movies of 2023. Oh, I was showing all of them on the left. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, hold on. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, everyone watching needs glasses and just happened not to be wearing the glasses at that right moment. Okay, I think this should work instead. Here we go. Right? There we go. Yay. So these are Mystery Chris's top movies of 2023. There we go. Uh, Super Mario Brothers. I love this movie. Like, I know some people said they're disappointed with it, but to me, Super Mario Brothers is such a ridiculous premise that it's hard to make it work. And I think this movie managed to do a pretty damn good job with a such a ridiculous premise. Uh, I love the design of it. I love the uh, colors. The characters were... Uh, designs were really well done uh it now it's true yes this movie was geared towards you know younger children maybe it wasn't as clever or funny as say you know a shrek movie or one of the pixar movies that you know has a lot of things in it that could be enjoyed by older people but uh, i still thought it was a solid movie and uh, it really stood out amongst a lot of the movies that came out this year and so uh, i do recommend people seeing it if they haven't seen it I still haven't seen it, and I'm very excited. I do want to see it. Yeah. And I know some people are saying, you know, Princess Daisy is a girl boss. And, like, I didn't really see that. They did give her a little bit more to do, but, uh, you know, she still needed help. She's not like she saved a day by herself or what we're typically see in these type of movies. And so uh, I enjoyed it. Voice acting's pretty good, you know. I would have liked Chris Pratt to have done the – traditional Mario voice, but I guess they thought that would have been too annoying for an hour and a half, just to hear, hey, it's me, I'm Mario. <laughs> two, <laughs> almost two hours, <laughs> who knows? I don't know. Okay, next one. Yeah. This is the creator. So I, I like this movie because I know, again, I'm, all these movies people that quite like, because a lot of the main complaint of this movie was that people were saying it wasn't very original, but I thought it was as original as you can be for a blockbuster, particularly a blockbuster that involves uh, AI. Because you were doing a, a big scale blockbuster movie with AI. How different can it be from The Matrix or Terminator? Like, I, human beings have been telling stories for thousands of years. There's no original stories to be told anymore. What we see now is stories that are told in a way that we're not used to, particularly since, you know, movies you know motion pictures were invented like the way movies evolved changed the way we perceive the stories you know as movies evolved directing got better acting got better production values got better music got better cinematography got better all these technical aspects and on-screen stuff got better and better and so our view of a lot of these old stories especially with disney since most of disney's classical movies are based on old stories like our views of these were that they were original even though the stories themselves weren't so much original and so for a movie like this yes it's reminiscent of a lot of um big blockbuster movies but uh to me i think they did as good as a job as you can do uh considering that this premise and uh i enjoyed it even though parts of it maybe didn't quite make as much sense but i again i like it when they take chances in trying to do something original they may not ex succeed uh as much as some of us would like at times but um i think it's got to be we got to celebrate this when hollywood takes these chances on these things and i was disappointed seeing that the creator bombed at the box office because this just means that you know studios are not going to take chances with smaller sci-fi stuff unless you know some director can convince them to make a, a movie on a small budget, which this movie is made on 80 million budget, which it's crazy. But if a director could do it smaller than that, maybe you know he convince Hollywood to go forward with that. But um, unfortunately, when these movies fail, it just it, it gives more credence to this idea that people are only going to see star Wars and these big sci-fi stuff that we've uh, been familiar with for, for decades. And, you know, unfortunately I think we're just going to see more of the same since movies mm -hmm. like this fail. I, I'd never even heard of this one. I've got to check this one out. Thank you. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And again, like I said, some parts, you know, 
a little predictable, but uh, they tried and that's what I appreciate. Your next one, please. So Dungeons and Dragons, this was a shocker because I thought this movie was going to be garbage. I saw the original one. I don't know how many people saw the original that came out like 2000, which was awful. And I remember seeing the trailer for this. I was like, ah, oh, it probably looks like it's only going to be a shade better than that one. But I was pleasantly surprised. This movie was well written. Mm -hmm. It was funny. Um, I wasn't even all that woke. There maybe parts you could say that, like, uh, oh, maybe a little bit, but well, it wasn't that much. I just had a good time. I, I really enjoyed watching this movie, and I can't say enough good things about it. I'm just recommend it to people who haven't seen it. It's just a fun movie. I should watch it. Michelle Rodriguez is in it. I like her. Yeah, even though she plays the same character in every movie. She's basically yeah. herself. She yeah. just talks in a monotone voice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> same thing. Godzilla minus one. This movie is excellent as I'm not telling anybody anything they don't already know because Lots of people talk about how awesome this movie is, and it is. It's a fantastic movie. Best Godzilla movie ever, hands down. And the thing I liked about this movie was the depth that it had. A uh, friend of mine had texted me recently about uh, the last Predator movie that came out, Prey, and he was raving about it, how much he loved it. And I didn't really love that movie. And I was telling his reasons why, but I started thinking about it, and I was like, Godzilla minus one is how you do a traditional or old monster or character whatever uh that's how you do it in a period timeline mm. you know without it feeling gimmicky because prey that predator movie i was talking about felt gimmicky by putting okay. predator in um with some native americans in the what century was it the, it's the 18th century i forget uh that really didn't provide much depth to the story and to the overall you know franchise like the, the deepest you know um theme I could think of for Prey was that, you know, women shouldn't be confined to traditional gender roles. I'm like, oh, well, I haven't seen that before. But with Godzilla, by putting it right at the end of World War II, it allowed them to explore the true meanings of honor and sacrifice that are values that are innate to Japanese culture and to use that period to explore how the Japanese were processing, not only having the atomic bombs dropped on them, but coming to terms with some of the things, the horrors that the Japanese government did, I thought was excellent. It provided so much more depth. It made me care about the characters, it made me feel emotional for what happened to the characters, which never happens in a Godzilla movie. So I've been a Godzilla fan since I was a kid. I've never liked a human <laughs> characters in these movies. I always fast forward it because I hated it so much. I just want to see Godzilla knock buildings over and fight other monsters. But this movie did such a great job balancing the monster element and the human storylines. It's just, I can't say enough good things about how great this movie was. And to, to think that this movie is made for less than 15 million is just insane. And I'm hoping that Hollywood will learn from this. And I'm hoping people will start embracing more movies like this. Uh, especially foreign movies. I need to do a better job looking at foreign movies. You know, I, I in the beginning of this episode, read all these old movies I'm watching. Well, I really want to start watching more foreign movies because uh, a lot of these modern Hollywood stuff just isn't, isn't cutting it. And so Godzilla Minus One is just a, a great film. And um, I, I know I've recommended a lot of movies, but, you know, I really recommend this movie. <laughs> so wow. Go see okay. it if you haven't. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen it. So this is now on our list. Thank you. And for number one, number one, they clone Tyrone. So it what made me this? sad. Well, that's the problem. This movie came out on the same weekend that Barbie and Oppenheimer came out. It completely overshadowed it. It came out on Netflix. And this movie, uh, for those who don't know, is basically a, <laughs> it's going to sound funny. Uh, it's a, a pimp uh, played by Jamie Foxx, a, a hoe. I forget the lady who plays her. Um, and a drug dealer played by John Boyega stumble across a cloning operation, a mysterious cloning operation in the hood. And so it's basically a cross between Scooby Doo and a black exploitation film. Hmm. And it's such a bizarre, bizarre premise that uh, is why I put this for number one number because I love love the premise and the messaging in it. I don't think is really whoa. I think a lot of what it's actually similar to stuff that I've been saying about black culture. 
And so it does the mess in messaging in the end does get a little muddy. And I don't know if perhaps they somebody maybe wanted to make the traditional what you expect the the statement about, you know, the social commentary to be in a movie like this. But uh, I was actually surprised that it was a little bit more nuanced in it. Uh, the ending doesn't quite stick as much as it should. And it gets a little messy, but uh, I just love this premise. Uh, the performances of all the actors I just mentioned was great. And I'm just uh, saddened that this movie got overshadowed by Barbie and Oppenheimer because nobody talked about this movie. <laughs> nobody really knows about it. I've told yeah. people about it. They're like, what is that? And just maybe kind of sad because I want more movies like this that have weird premises. Like I want Hollywood to take more chances like this. And uh, I hope despite it not doing uh, great in terms of viewership that, you know, they will start investing in, in more movies like this because we, we got to keep pushing to, to do weirder things and trying to make as original stories as we can. Well, thank you for this list. Uh, hopefully there's a lot of stuff on it that I haven't seen. And hopefully there's a lot that the audience hasn't seen as well that they can go and check out. I love it when we cover things that we liked and not just the things that sucked. So I I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's important. We got to highlight good stuff. You know, I don't want to be someone who's just complaining all the time. So many good things. We need to recognize that. And I know for <laughs> just look at your picture. <laughs> Your avatar just changed. What? <laughs> your avatar. I just looked at your avatar. Oh, caught me off guard. People were laughing because I still had my Halloween avatar up. So I just, yeah. I just, since they were looking, since they were looking, I was like, well, let's just put something funny up. <laughs> Go are, ahead. Are, are, you, are, are, are you a dwarf in the new Lord of the Rings? <laughs> Female dwarf? They're supposed to be. Yeah. Here, but, you know, it's like the, best Kimberly. Hair, <laughs> the best wig and, and beard <laughs> set. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, like I say, for uh, this upcoming year uh, with our show, I think we we want to start try to highlight more good stuff going on and highlighting stuff that's being produced outside of the uh, big Hollywood studios. Because uh, you know, I think if we want to get serious about embracing this, you know, parallel economy and putting our money towards good things, then I think we, as you know, a whole and speaking. Um, for our sphere, our pop culture sphere that we're in. I think we all need to do a better job of uh, really highlighting, you know, people who are making great stuff, you know, all over the board for, for everything. And even if it's obscure, I think we, we got to, to embrace this stuff. Cause you know, we we're, we're seeing with, with what Hollywood's doing, like they, they're just continuing to drive things in the ground. And that's why I was saying in the beginning, like the apathy uh, has set in for me for so many things because I've just, I've, I'm, learning to let go of some of these older IPs and eventually they'll be rebooted. But for now, Hollywood seems content on continuing to drive them into the ground. And I'm just, I'm done. I'm not, I'm not going, I, I make fun of people who just consume mindlessly consume uh, stuff. Like I see people who like love, you know, everything, star Wars, everything, star Trek, everything's been produced recently. And I'm like, oh, some of it's good, but a lot of it's bad. I just don't understand how you could like everything, but as much as I make fun of them, you know, I don't want to be someone who's still consuming the bad stuff, even though I'm, you know, making fun of it or laughing at it or hating on it. I don't want to still be consuming that, you know, I don't want to be a mindless consumer myself because I think a lot of us are addicted to consuming uh, products made under these IPs. And yeah. we, I think we just got to got to move on, you know. I, I agree, and I'm excited about people. I was just talking last night with French Porch, Front Porch Conservative about people who are making series and films and stuff outside of the system. And I think that's a it's a much bigger budget and and production than than doing something like a book or or even a comic book, although that's huge. You know, Eric July didn't just do a comic book. he he built a whole company, which is huge. So if he can do that, People can do TV and film, and we're we're gonna continue to see more of that. Um, Pirate Tomsky, thank you for the super chat for two pounds. Says I mindlessly <laughs> consume this podcast. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I've got something to show you now. This is a little. We'll just tack this on at the end. This is my best of twenty twenty three. Uh, I didn't get a worst, and that's fine. We'll just do yeah, the best fine. of, and it's not complete. Um, and and I know I said I wasn't going to do mine, but here, I'll just show you the ones I got. 
All right. Let's Are you look. excited? I am. I'm okay. trying to think, what could it be? What could it now, be? Now, here's the caveat. Most of the things on this, this list came out in 2023, but some of them didn't. I just watched them for the first time in 2023. <laughs> so I'll count it. I'll allow it. You, you count it? Okay. <laughs> and and then, that means the first one, Deadwood. Oh, yeah. I finally gave in. Pirate Tomsky. Yes, you know it. There he is in the shed. <laughs> He's been hounding. He's been hounding me and Mystery Chris to watch Deadwood. He's so excited. Oh my gosh, I finally watched it and I get it. It's brilliant. It's one of the best TV shows ever. Uh it's a western. It's it's three it's only 3 seasons long. I'm 15 years late to review this to watch it. <laughs> so it's technically not in 2023. Um and and because we watched it so so late after the fact, so, you know, when it premiered, I, I, my husband and I got to experience the crushing sadness at learning that it was prematurely canceled alone 15 years later. <laughs> so, that, that's so it's, always the, it's the, the thing yeah. about shows like this. Cause like there's shows people tell me, Oh, you got to watch this, but it was like canceled after season two. It was like, but do I want to get invested in this and then be so upset that it doesn't continue on after like season two or three? Well, it is three seasons and wait, Pirate corrects me, says it was 20 years ago, Carrie, 20 years ago. It started in 2004. Anyway, it's out. Let me tell you, you do want to get invested because it's three amazing seasons with great characters, great dialogue. The, 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 the characters evolve. There's a lot of depth to them. This guy on the right, Al Swearingen, you start off hating him, but you end up loving him. <clears throat> There's a lot of growth for all of them. There's excellent bad guys. Um, and again, the language is, is sort of, it's, it's Shakespearean with a lot of, um, filthy, uh, swear words and, and, and it's all taking place. It's in the West, you know, it's during the gold rush and they have some real characters in it or characters based on real people like Calamity Jane is in it. Um, while Bill Hancock, you know, so, um, you, you definitely want to check this out. And then to sort of appease all of the sad fans, you know, when it was prematurely canceled, they did come out with a movie to try and wrap things up uh, 10 or 15 years later. And you can watch that movie, which we did. So it's three seasons plus a movie. And I just, I love it. Um, so that's on my list. Best of 2023, even though it came out 2004. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <Down it. laughs> okay. Here's my next one. Also, sadly, prematurely canceled, Joe Pickett. Oh, Joe Pickett. Okay, so season two, I believe, did come out in 2023. So I don't think I'm too off the mark with this one. If not, it was 2022 or 2023. Anyway, we just watched it. It's it's another Western, although it's contemporary. And it's based on a series of novels that I haven't read. We just stumbled on this. It's like, hey, I know, you, uh, you know your Amazon or whatever, your recommendations is like, you appear to enjoy watching things with men in cowboy hats. Would you like to watch Joe Pickett? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, it's about a game warden and he ends up solving. There's two seasons also prematurely canceled. However, we don't know the final word on this yet because I heard that it it's possibly being shopped around to potentially be picked up somewhere else but um it's two seasons of joe and his family it's a great uh character drama but also it's great family values i mean he and his wife and kids i mean it really shows i think something that's missing in a lot of modern entertainment and woke entertainment it's a strong father figure and and you know he, who has a a broken past he comes from a broken family and and is trying to figure out life and do it the best he can and to be a good father and to be a good husband and get to see not just there's the the crime solving element and the murder mystery in each season but there's also you get to see him struggling as a human being as a father as a dad and and being the provider and i just i absolutely love that um there's some really touching moments in this series so um, and if you like the great outdoors, you're going to love the scenery in this one as well. So, wow. um, the last of us, I actually really enjoyed oh, yeah. this. I enjoyed that too. I didn't put it on my list, but yeah, so I love post-apocalyptic oh. shows, comics, 
movies. I love zombie books, um, zombie storyline. I just love everything about it. And this this one, I know there was some criticism of some of it, and I agree that it 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 needed it needed some criticism. Um, you know, so they made one of the characters gay, uh, and then they, I guess, when they were promote, which I didn't mind them doing that, uh, but. But then when they were promoting it, they did the woke thing where they were like over the top, like we're changing television with a gay character. <laughs> and as you and I know, that's not true. There've been gay characters forever. Like, <laughs> stop it. Quit pretending. It's like when they pretend like first female strong character lead. No, it's not. Stop it. You know, Jennifer Lawrence, <laughs> I'm the first female action. He no. We are Gen X. We've been around. You guys are lying. Quit pretending like this is new. And we're some backwards culture that's never seen a gay character before. Like, stop it. Um, <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. Other other than the heavy handed marketing on that episode. Um, Pirate Did Tomsky. You, uh, what did they say? Pirate Tomsky, thanks for the super chat. Five <laughs> pounds says the last of us is the world after the woke zombies take over. <laughs> yes. I, I know it's only one season, but uh, do you like it better than The Walking Dead? Well, I like it better than what The Walking Dead became. I quit watching The Walking Dead because mm -hmm. it got so terrible. But, so we'll but, say in its prime, though. Like Walking in Dead prime, in its prime? What do you no, say? No, I like The Walking Dead in its prime better. Okay. You know, the season where they put Carol out, where they kicked Carol out, <clears throat> mm -hmm. that season and was excellent. And, okay. and, it, and, that, and it got so crazy, I quit, I quit watching it. Also, I quit reading it. I haven't read it in years. I used to read. Mm -hmm. I read the comics way before it was a TV show. But... um. But but You're it is very it. close. It's very well done, though. <laughs> it is very well done. I love survivor stories in a, in a post-apocalyptic world. I like the themes of these kind of stories. I think that's why I like zombie stories so much. I like the themes of survival and sometimes how, you know, humans end up your fellow human when the, when all of society breaks down and there are no laws reigning in behavior that you start to see that your fellow human is the real monster so in many cases. And I like that kind of thing, exploring good and evil in humanity. And what do people do when there are no legal restrictions and societies collapse? And see, that was why I hesitated watching this show because I, I kind of am tired of dystopians and uh, post-apocalyptic uh, television shows and movies, especially since there's so much anxiety in the real world about our society and it crumbling. And so uh, I, I find it kind of depressing, even though I did like this show. I, I'm not really watching many shows or movies uh, that deal with similar circumstances like this. I'll always watch them. I can't. I, it's just one of my things. I've always been drawn to these kind of stories. So did I don't you, know. Were you one of the people who like when COVID first started? uh happening were you one of the people who watched like those um uh pandemic movies like i oh, remember I it was trending on netflix i was like why do people want to watch this like we could be living this <laughs> soon i like, did watch you know. a few of those yeah you know outbreak i watched outbreak, that again yeah it was yeah. the other one contagion or something i think well it makes sense i mean i've heard studies I, i've heard uh we you and i have talked about studies before where people during hard times in a nation right so during war or economic depression, or let's say a pandemic where the government's becoming very authoritarian, people seek an outlet in uh, movies that deal with horrific things. And so viewing the popularity of horror movies increases during those times, or monster movies. If you think about when the big monster movie boom happened, it coincides with people going through dark times. They watch dark things because I think in a way it helps to alleviate some of those feelings. And also you see something much worse on the screen in front of you. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're like, this is this is not so bad what I'm living through, right? But that's weird. Okay. Um, next up. Now it doesn't have the title on here, but this is Love and Death. This is an HBO series. And this is a, the second one that was done in a span of two years. So I don't know if you remember, but on my best list last year of 2022, I had Candy, the movie Candy. Oh, yeah. Or, not, yeah. or the TV show Candy. This is about the same murder. So in 1980, Candy Montgomery in Texas, a church lady, upstanding member of the community, married with kids. She murdered her lover, her married lover's uh, wife, who was supposed to be one of her friends from church. She murdered her with an axe, struck her over 47 times. 
and had been having an affair with her husband and then killed her in her home. And then, and this was in Texas in the 1980s in Wiley, Texas, then washed up and went back to church. And because she was, they were in the middle of putting on some production, went back to church, tried to come up with an alibi, totally hide, which try, tried to hide what she did, lied. You know, they ended up finding out it was her. And you will, if you don't know how this trial wrapped up, you will be shocked. Um, so I don't know why, but I guess this happens in Hollywood sometimes where somebody's shopping a story and then, and somebody else wants that story, but so they just have a different writer and they, they mm -hmm. do it. So this happened back to back 2022 candy was a series about this true crime. And that was on Hulu and starred Jessica Biel. This one was HBO and it came out in 2023. And this one's called love and death. They filmed the, some of the courthouse scenes in Georgetown, Texas, you know, oh. at the courthouse. Yeah. And in fact, I saw them filming one of the scenes and I was really annoyed and yelled, go back <laughs> to California. Cause I couldn't find, I couldn't find parking to get my coffee. <laughs> but it's like, get, you know, people get excited when they see movies that are being filmed. I don't yeah. get excited. I'm like, get out of here. I'm trying to get coffee. <laughs> There's no parking because of you people. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, it was great of the two. I, I would watch both. If you like true crime and you like dramatizations of true crime, you will enjoy both of these. And they both have, um, they do, a, they do a great job in different ways. However, of the two, the one on Hulu it, it, called Candy is my favorite. Um, mm. But I also really enjoyed, I also really enjoyed Love and Death that came out this year. So. I remember seeing uh, screenshots of, uh, I think it's Jessica Biel who's in Candy, right? Jessica Biel and Justin Timberlake surprisingly is really great as the sheriff in oh, that one. Mary, that's yeah. Weird. Uh, but yeah, I remember seeing uh, the trailer for that and not even realizing that was Jessica Biel. She, like, she disappears in that role. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. She's amazing in that role, and I think the acting is better in that one. A little, there's a couple things I think are better in that one. Although some of the set design and stuff is better in this one. But anyway, of the two, if you only watch one, watch Candy. But if you if you like true crime, watch both because this one's great too. And they handle the subject matter a little bit differently. Hmm. Okay. Now this one is not 2023, but it's fairly recent, I guess 2020 or something, 2021. And I just watched it in 2023. Why women kill. Um, there are two seasons. I, I think it got canceled after that, but it doesn't matter. It's not, the kind of thing in my opinion where you need to see how it's all resolved it's just fun to watch and i haven't seen season two yet um season one it's the premise is it, it's just like campy and sort of the way barbie was fun in terms of set design and visually very stimulating and 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 pleasurable like it's like that it's beautifully done it the premise is it it's focus. It focuses on anyway for season one. I don't. I don't know about season two, but for season one, they focus on a house in Glendale, California, a big man, one of these mansions in Glendale, and they focus on three time periods with three different women, and or three different couples rather, married couples, and all that you know at the beginning of this the season is that someone gets murdered in each of these couples, and the first the first time period is the 1960s and. That's her there in the middle. Um, oh, gosh, what is her name? She's a brilliant actress. Hold on. I had it pulled up. Jennifer. Um, somebody in the chat will probably know. Jennifer Goodwin. So Jennifer Goodwin is the wife in the 1960s version. On the left there is Lucy Liu. Now, Lucy Liu is in the 1980s version. So the house has been totally redone. It's funny because you see the same house in all three of these couples' lives, but it's very period-specific. And Lucy Liu is the best actress, the best character in this whole series. It, I, I would just, I would sit down and just watch her scenes. She is hilarious. She does an amazing job over the top, almost like soap opera acting. <laughs> and in this 1980s, um, very, she plays this very narcissistic, very wealthy, image obsessed woman. And she finds out, that her husband is in the first, I'm not going to spoil too much because it, it's very obvious. I don't know how she didn't know, but in the very first episode, she finds out her husband 
of 10 years, her third husband, by the way, is gay and he's been cheating on her with men and she can't and she's it's funny it's a comedy <laughs> thing and <laughs> oh, okay. it sounds like it would be sad but you don't really you don't really feel sad for her because she doesn't really care anyway she doesn't seem like she can feel love anyway she's just total you know rich narcissist and um is imagine a campy soap opera that's her so the 1980s is my favorite of the three time periods and all it's all about Lucy Liu. I just I, I can't rave enough. Go watch her. Even if you just watch her scenes on YouTube, it's hysterical. Um, Jennifer Goodwin there in the middle, as I mentioned, she's in the 1960s version. She plays um, a housewife, a stay at home housewife who also finds out a secret. I'm not going to spoil that. And um, she's brilliant. She's an amazing actress. She's probably my second favorite time period. Okay, then we skip over to the right. I don't know this actress's name. I think it's like Kirby or something. I think she's so cool. She only has one name, Kirby. <laughs> and she plays, now this one I can't stand, but I also love to hate it, to see what's happening in it. Because it's sort of secretly unintentionally based. Let me tell you the premise of this is modern day. So on the right, on the right here, she's a, a black woman who's a feminist, by the way. They make that very clear in the first episode. She's married to this cuck male feminist husband, and they have an open marriage. And she has all these lovers, and presumably he has lovers. And uh, he explains how he first met her at a feminist rally or something. And she was the sexiest feminist he had ever seen. And it was her idea to have an open marriage. And and she wears the pants totally she's a lot high-powered lawyer we're supposed to believe he's uh he hasn't he's a screenwriter but he hasn't sold a script in two years and she resents him and she completely wears the pants tells him what to do completely emasculates him everything and and what i like about it is that even though it's horrible they proceed they proceed to you meet some of her lovers and stuff and they you start to see whether they intended to show this or not, how terrible polyamory is, how terrible feminism is, how terrible the this sort of modern poo-pooing of traditional values in a traditional home life is. That's that's my take on it. So I don't think they pretend, intended to present it that way, <laughs> but the more that their storyline unfolds with their open marriage and their you know open lax morals, and they start to hate each other everything starts to fall apart because why not? There's no boundaries. There's no rules. Now I'm not saying that things aren't falling apart in the 1960s version. They are, but then in that version, you've got people breaking the rules on the right. And there's no rules at all that there's no shared foundation of belief or anything. And so you see that unfold in the household and that's kind of interesting. So mm -hmm. um, I would, I would definitely recommend it if you like comedies, uh, and just for the Lucy Lou 1980s thing alone. And then, and then if you find any of the other subject matter interesting, yes, watch this one. You'll like it. Okay. <laughs> Never heard of the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, and then what else? I think I have one more thing on here. Oh yeah. This is, see, I didn't get, I didn't get very far. I didn't finish. This is a movie we just watched. Um, this was from 2023. It came out in December and it's a uh, maestro. It's a, it's about um, Leonard Bernstein and his life. It's a, it's a biography pick and it's directed by written by and directed by Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper plays Leonard Bernstein, Carrie Mulligan's in it. They're both brilliant actors, but I have never seen Bradley Cooper perform like this. It is unbelievable. He, he really, he loses himself in the character. The makeup is so impressive. The, the aging makeup, he looks real. He looks a lot like Leonard Bernstein. You wouldn't believe that he'd be able to do that. And the acting is just brilliant. And the music that they bring in, his music that they bring in is amazing. And um, it's a drama. There's a lot of very sad moments, of course. And if you know anything about his life and Look, here's another open relationship kind of thing that fails, <laughs> I think, in some ways. But at the very, you do get to see him. He does, he does love his wife. That much is very apparent in this movie. Um, and and she is, a, she is a person who starts off being okay with this open sort of arrangement, and then and towards the end, you can see it really take its toll on her and on their relationship. And 
Carrie Mulligan's just such a great actress. Like I was, I was sobbing at several points during this film. Hmm. So, um, yeah. What attracted you to, to watch the film in the begin to begin with? Actually, Leah Cole, one of the commenters here at deep program sometimes mentioned it in a chat, I think. And when my husband was on and, he's really interested in biographies and, you know, Leonard Bernstein was responsible for the music and some of the most famous American musicals. And, and so we were just, uh, she said it was great. So we were just curious to check it out. And it was. That's cool. I love Bradley Cooper. I think he's underrated. I, yeah. I mean, I didn't really know much about him before this. I, this was amazing. I'm a huge fan now. So yeah, I don't think he got into acting until he was like mid to late thirties, I think. Something yeah. crazy like that. Because I remember like years ago seeing him as a host of a like travel show. This was before he was a star, and I was like, "Oh, so he's been around doing various things, but he didn't have his big break until later in life." Wow. Like Harrison Ford. I didn't know that about Harrison Ford. Well, it's good. Go watch it. That's my best of. Squat and P is here and says, just made it here. Welcome back, Mystery Chris. <laughs> Squat and P, I love that name. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Therese. <laughs> Therese says, I've watched Bradley Cooper since Alias. <laughs> Let's see so, if my camera's working now. Is it better? Yeah, it is. There oh, you are. Good. Yay. That's that weird. I apologize. Texas Sheep Lady, if you end up watching this one later, I'm, I'm sorry. And to anyone else that was like, I can't take these tech problems. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, I think we should give our thoughts overall 23 and then we could talk about stuff in 24 I did have one link of some movies if we want to just look at some upcoming releases and give our thoughts on that but to finish off 2023 like what, what are your thoughts overall what's happening pop culture wise 2023 2023 you know I'm not the best person to answer this I'll, I'll tell you when I'm out of my element I'm not because <laughs> I, I'm kind of spacey when it comes to entertainment and what's happening in the moment. You know, when I I, I, I go as a guest on Toxic Femme and a lot of other entertainment pop culture shows, and um, sometimes I can I'm, I know exactly what they're talking about, what's in the news, and I'm able to contribute. But other times, I don't know, and I didn't watch, and I'm not going to. And so I'm not a good person to say the pulse of 2023 because and look, look at your list, for example. I'd only seen like one or two movies off of that list. My 2023 list has things on it that did not come out in 2023. <laughs> 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 so I don't so know. Two years stuff for 2023 will be on your list then. No. Yeah, I'm not the best person to answer that. Now, if you ask me about culture in general, I think culture in general, people are getting sick of the woke crap. I think they're sick of woke entertainment. I think everything keeps flopping. I think, oh, I should have put South Park Pandaverse on my list as the best of because that was <laughs> so funny. And it it mocked all the Kathleen Kennedy Disney stuff and just how people are tired of it. They want something good. And so I think that's going to continue into 2024. And I think you're going to start to see more uh, places step, hopefully step away from the woke agenda and just start making good entertainment again. I am so tired of this crap that's like, Oh, it's a diverse cast. Oh, we took this, your favorite thing. We made it all women. And oh, it's going to be, no, I'm tired of it. Just make <laughs> something good. Quit pandering. Well, I can only speak to the big blockbuster fantasy sci-fi stuff. Cause I didn't really see a whole lot of movies that worked in that category, but overall, I don't, it's not the strongest year, but I don't think it's the worst year that we, we've seen. Um, I did a thing where I went back and looked at some of the big action fantasy blockbuster films that came out uh, in previous years. So like I just went to Google and start typing in movies from 20 uh, or 2004, you know, 2010, stuff like that. And looking at those, it seemed to me, and this is my, my thesis and you can tell me what you think, but I, my thesis is that, most of these movies, at least are most of these years in the past, I don't know, 25 years or so, have seen usually about three to four good to great blockbuster type films, and the rest were terrible. Hmm. And so if I'm looking at it, comparing it to this year, 
it's kind of similar because as you see with my list, there were some blockbusters included on the best list. Um, but there's far more bad movies than there were good movies in terms of the big action fantasy film yes. films. Because when I looked at, uh, let's just off the top of my head, 2002, look at that year. Some of the good movies that came out that year was um, Spider-Man, the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man movie came out. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers came out. Minority Port uh, came out. Hmm. Uh, Blade Two, those good movies. But then if you look at the blockbuster movies that came out that were horrible, there's tons of them. Star Trek Nemesis, awful. Uh, Die Another Day, the James Bond movie that killed off Pierce Brosnan's version of James Bond was awful. Scorpion King was awful. There's so many bad movies. And sometimes I do think some people do look back with rose-colored glasses in the past, think that maybe Hollywood was more consistent. And I will say, overall, they were a little bit more consistent in producing big blockbuster films that were good, but it it's not by much compared to today. The, the problems that we see in Hollywood today existed back then. It's just now sprinkle in woke stuff. And I think some people are, are only talking about the woke stuff and not talking about these deeper cracks that have been in Hollywood for a very long time. I really think the Marvel stuff, the Marvel movies spoiled us. They, they made us think that that was the uh, new standard, uh, the, the new the you know, consistent quality of movies. Cause like what Marvel did in that 10 to 11 year period from like 2008 to 2019, where they produced 20 something movies and most of them were pretty good, if not great, is unheard of. Like, I don't know if we'll ever see that again. It's amazing how they were able to do that to begin with, but that hasn't been something that we've seen uh, with these other franchises. Cause think about how many other franchises that have been told uh, multiple movies that have been uh, told over decades, like James Bond. You know, James Bond, it's been 60 years, I think. I think the first one, Dr. No, is 63, so 20, uh, 61 years, I guess. Uh, but they have 25 to 27 James Bond films, depending which ones you count. But out of those, how many of those movies how are, many are good great? to great? Yeah. I mean, good to great, if you're saying that, then I would say maybe, I don't know, uh, little over 50 60 percent but great oh that's even a small percent you know star trek there's been 13 star trek movies told over a 35 year period how many of them are good to great less than 50 percent are good and there's pretty much only like one or two that can be considered great star wars you have six star wars movies made before disney purchased it I told over a 30 year period how many of those are good to great you know 50 percent if you're being generous to return of a jedi which i like return of jedi but it's not of the same level as Empire Strikes Back in the original. It's just not. And then if we look at like regular superhero movies, think about how many superhero movies started off the franchise, started off good, and then quickly went to garbage. Yeah. Uh, Christopher Reeve Superman films, first two, great. Three or four sucked. Uh, Tim Burton Batman, first two are good. Uh, three and four sucked. Um, the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, first two are good. Third one sucked, and then continued sucking with Andrew Garfield. Uh, Brian Singer X-Men movies. First two were good. Third one sucked. And then when they re did a soft reboot with X-Men First Class and Days of Future Past, those were some great. But then X-Men Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix sucked. Blade. First two Blade movies. Third one sucked. Like it's the, the norm has been that Hollywood has not been able to maintain this consistency of movies, even if they have years between uh, these movies to tell these these overall arching stories related to these IPs. It just can't maintain that. And I think a lot of times it's because they end up trying to appeal to too many demographics. A lot of these films, the films I just mentioned, a lot of them appeal to children, even if they weren't designed for children. Like think about like Robocop. I talk about Robocop all the time because I saw Robocop as a kid. I shouldn't have, but I saw it. It was very violent. <laughs> And they made toys, though, of rated R films. They had a cartoon of RoboCop in the 80s. And then for RoboCop 3, they decided to make a PG-13 and give RoboCop a little best friend, a little girl that helps him defeat the bad guys. Like, we see this pattern in our movies. They keep dumbing it down, trying to make it more to, to kids and sell more merchandise. Uh, what it just was happens over and over again. Gremlins 2. <laughs> I love Gremlins 2. Don't we talk about Gremlins 2? <laughs> Gremlins 2 is terrible. No, what it's are you great. What talking about? No. It's fantastic. No. Can we put a poll up? Mr. Chris, <laughs> no. We are putting yes. a poll up. 
Are you, you ever see that Key and Pale skit where they did yes, it? Yes, <laughs> it is so funny that Key and because they know how terrible it was and they're pointing it out. I love uh, it. Are you just are you just saying it was great to be ironic? <laughs> no, I'm never ironic, Carrie. Love it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so like Hollywood has just not been very good at maintaining consistencies for these VIPs. And so right now with you know, I guess what is it, uh phase four, phase five of Marvel movies, they just can't maintain the consistency that they did with uh phases one, two, and three. Even though not all those movies were great, obviously, you know, Thor 2 and Iron Man 2 weren't great. Compared to Phase 4, they're Shakespeare, but uh, overall, what Marvel did in that 11-year period is just amazing. Okay, the poll's going. If you guys want to weigh in on Mr. Chris's wrong opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Chat, Poon Ra, you it's great. It's funny. They had... Uh, uh, Red Letter Media did actually did a uh, review of it. Yeah, they liked it. It was good stuff. Um, currently, wow, the polls fluctuating as it's second by second. <laughs> it's nail biting. Eighteen, fifty six percent say it sucked. Forty four percent says it was amazing, but it keeps changing. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun movie. <laughs> I'm shocked that for I'm shocked that even. 47% say it was amazing. Yeah, what yeah, my people. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay says, come on and sell it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had a uh, gremlin that was seeing uh, Sinatra, uh, New York. You had all these different ones. You had a spider gremlin. That was pretty cool. A bat gremlin. And the bat gremlin like fell into like some some concrete and it flew up, became a gargoyle. That's awesome. It's so stupid. It's so fun. It's kind of, if I were not sober, that's the the only <laughs> way I would watch that movie is if I were stoned or something. You know, it's like that kind of a movie. <laughs> this it's drag. great. It's it's like Die Hard with gremlins. The drag gremlin. You like that's Die right. Hard, don't you? Yeah. So you should like this movie. <laughs> Nerdy Girl says it's completely Looney Tunes. <laughs> and it's great. It's so fun. Yeah, yeah there was a money. there was a gremlin drag Adam. Um by the way, I wanted to highlight this from earlier. Texas Sheep Lady's back. Thank you, lady, for returning. I think we got our tech figured out, at least for today. And then by Monday, hopefully I'm gonna be in the studio and wired. So she says, remember that it's a wonderful life was a box office failure. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Jeremy Stewart. Oh, I should have found the, uh, <laughs> there was a video recently I meant to send to you of uh, a compilation of old uh, film stars like cursing, like when <laughs> there's like bloopers. It's yeah. just so weird seeing them like just go crazy and start. Oh, I would acting, love to like, see that. Threats. Yeah. Yeah. Send me that. Helena Bla Blavatsky says there was a vegetable gremlin. Yes. Yes. That's how ridiculous. They're so creative. Look at all these type of gremlins they could come up with. They're just like looking around the room and there's also vegetables. So oh, let's make one of that. That's great. And then uh, Magua, uh, uh, he becomes Rambo in it. And then like start shooting like paper clips and stuff at him. I can't believe this poll is 50-50 now. Are you kidding me? Hell yeah. <laughs> we need an obvious win. I'm gonna text my husband to go online and vote in this poll. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, I know you're doing something important, but can you log on and vote on this Gremlins poll? You're like, oh, I love that movie. You're like, I don't even know who you are. <laughs> yeah, he probably loves it. Oh man. Okay. So what about 2024? What do you think is going to happen? Um, I think it's going to be a lot of the same. If you, if you pulled that link of movies coming out because <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah, I need a shirt. You, know? <laughs> you ain't that. Okay. Pull up which I wish link? we could pull all black people, see what their feelings on them. Get from this to this. Uh, pull up that 2024. Uh, like, it's so weird to say 2024. I can't believe 2024. Um, but look, some of the movies, but 
again, I think it's going to be similar to what we talked about yesterday. Or wait, wait, which one year? of these links? There, I've got a, a theatrical okay. movie stats, 2024 movies. 2024 movies. Okay. But I think it's going to be similar to what we talked about last year when we were looking ahead at 2023 and how we saw that um, the same thing Hollywood has been doing for years, they continue to do, making sequels to movies that don't need sequels or doing remakes and, you know, finding old television shows and rebooting those. I think it's going to be a lot of the same. As to the quality of those things, I don't know. I am looking forward towards uh, the Dune movie. I think that's going to be one of the best movies of the year. But off the top of my head, I can't really think of any other big blockbuster type movies I'm looking towards. I would try to, I would like to branch out. I'm going to start watching some of these uh, more minor movies. You know, I guess some of these are going to be uh, very quickly put on streaming if they're not, you know, on streaming. I mean, that first one's obviously going to Netflix or it's on cinema and yeah, Netflix. Okay. So but, what are these? You want to read out some of the titles? Oh, yeah. Just scroll down and just like look at some of these uh, movies that are. Um, well, okay, so Jan January of 2024. I haven't heard probably of any of these. Again, I'm a bit spacey, modern entertainment. But mm. so Society of the Snow in select cinemas and on Netflix. Wow, only select cinemas. Okay. <laughs> um, Night Swim. Yeah, everything you can scroll down. You There's fear. a lot of things. So, Wait, yeah, so. but this I'm looking at this one because this, this one interests me. Everything you fear is under the surface. That looks like a horror movie. I used to pee in the pool. People should have been afraid of me. I never this told is anybody a that. Feature I just confessed to the entire audience. Gross. And I'll do it again. Uh, this is a feature length version of the 2014 short film about a woman swimming in her pool at night, terrorized by an evil spirit. Okay. Mm. Good grief. This is a movie with Daniel Levy from Schitt's Creek. Love Lost is Love Found. Well, are we just judging these based on the art? Because I can't really tell what these things are about. Race for Yeah, glory. I mean, yeah. Some of them. That's one of the things that does kind of suck, like especially uh, going on Netflix or streaming services. Because like back in the day, when you went to Blockbuster, you knew which movies were going to be like B movies because... It was basically like going to the store and looking at bottom shelf cereal, how bad like the graphic design was, because you knew it's going to be cheap, generic cereal, and you're fine with that. But today with streaming and all these you know movie posters, like the graphics have gotten so much better that it's very hard to tell the quality of that movie solely based on the graphic like we used to be able to. Mm -hmm. It is hard to tell. Um, what is this? The Beekeeper with Jason, Jason Statham. Yeah. I'm surprised he's still making movies. Like, are people watching this stuff? Like, I've never heard anybody rave about the Meg <laughs> to me. I know they just made a second one that came out last year. I'm like, he's doing all these, like, low, I don't want to say low budget, because some of these are coming out in movie theaters, but it's, like, under the radar kind of things where nobody's really talking about it. No one's excited about it. <laughs> Is this the what the beekeeper is going to be about? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ever since you showed me that, <laughs> can't see watching it. <laughs> Am I <it's> the bees? <laughs> he was in some big movie this year, wasn't he? Nicholas Cage. Yeah. It seems like he's been up. in some movies that have been cr critically acclaimed recently. I think whatever movie came out recently, I remember hearing some buzz about it. The uh, dream scenario? What is that? I don't know. I don't know you guys in the chat there. tell us. We don't know. What, what was the Nicolas Cage movie that came out recently that we should know about? Tell us. Okay. Self-Reliance. Uh, the Book of Clarence. What is this? The Book of Clarence. Oh, yeah. This is looks weird. I'm not sure what to think of this movie. <laughs> Struggling to find a better life, Clarence is captivated by the power of the rising Messiah and soon risks everything to carve a path to a divine existence. Um, there, then there's this sort of looks like a horror comedy down on the left, Destroy All Neighbors. I'm 
I'm curious if that Freud's last session is going to be any good because that details um, the friendship and debate between C.S. Lewis and Sigmund Freud over, you know, the existence of God. I remember some years ago, some years ago, I saw a PBS special where they had these, uh, it was a kind of a debate. It was a panel, it's kind of a, a round table of scientists, religious leaders, other people, and they were debating are going over the C.S. Lewis's writings and Freud's writings regarding religion and God, but they're also giving their own experiences and beliefs and stuff. And in between their talks, they'd have these reenactments of some of these you know, sessions that Freud and Lewis had. But um, I'm curious if this movie is going to be any good. It's got Anthony Hopkins in it and uh, still love him. He's still a great actor. So maybe it'll be good. Yeah, look at the movie story sees Freud invite iconic author C.S. Lewis to debate the existence of God and his unique relationship with his daughter and Lewis's unconventional relationship with his best friend's mother. I'm definitely going to watch this one, I'll tell you that. I'm interested in it. Um, okay. He went that way. What is this? I don't know. That one doesn't have a thing to click on. Role play. That looks bad. Um, maybe not, but it just, it looks low budget. Um, Founder's Day. That looks like a horror movie. It's like Cult a ripoff of the Purge. Yeah. Antonio Banderas is in something called Cult Killer. Revenge comes first. Hey, he's still around. Yeah. Good to see him in something. I, Sunrise. Go ahead. ISS movie. I'm not sure that's going to be good enough. I saw um, some TV ads for it. I might watch it. But it's interesting. It's about some um, astronauts, but American and I think Russian astronauts that are on a space station, International Space Station, when World War III breaks out beneath them. And each one gets orders from their respective countries to take command of the space station. I'm like, hmm, that could oh, wow. be interesting. That could be interesting. Yeah. I'm reading about this one right now. Tensions flare in the near future aboard the International Space Station as a conflict breaks out on Earth. Reeling, the U.S. and Russian astronauts receive orders from the ground. Take control of the station by any means necessary. Which brings me to you. <laughs> no. I mean, these movies are coming out in January, so I don't know if that's a good indication that they're not going to be pretty good. Because typically... Movies come out in January and February, although aren't very good. But although in recent years we have seen some good movies come out in February, but I don't know. Miller's Girl with Martin Freeman. Miller's a Light Girl. <laughs> a creative writing assignment yields complex results between a teacher and his talented student. Oh, I don't like that sound of that. <laughs> 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 yeah i don't want to um, see some teacher student thing <laughs> you're the man now dog <laughs> february oh so all of those like you said were january okay so february the promised land what is that i don't know it's about the oh, it's that guy one of those actors i've seen in a number of movies but i have no idea what his name is he was a bad guy in the Casino Royale. He plays a, a Danish explorer. The story of Lud Ludwig Collin, who pursued his lifelong dream to make the Heath, the Heath bring him wealth and honor. Okay. They didn't. They didn't race and gender swap him. The famous explorer. <laughs> <laughs> a little shocked. <laughs> So it's Henry Cavill's in this one. I don't know what to make of this one. This is I saw I watched it, I a trailer. Saw, I was like, um, hmm. yeah, I saw the trailer for this. It was kind of funny. It looks like it's a spoof of spy films, yeah. right? Argyle. Mm -hmm. I'll probably watch that. Sam Jackson's in it. I think Henry Cavill's secretly based. Like little bits and things he said and just make me seem that he might be a little in tune with the times. Lisa Frankenstein. It's a horror movie. 
a so coming that's comedy. Of, comedy. <laughs> oh, is it a a coming yeah. of rage love story about a teenager and her crush who happens to be a corpse? After a set of horrific circumstances bring him back to life, the two embark on a journey to find love, happiness, and a few missing body parts. Yeah, okay, I guess it's supposed to be hmm. a horror comedy. La Passion de Bowden Buffon. What? What about love? <laughs> I wish they speak English. Oh, the Bob Marley movie. I do want to see this. Bob Marley, One Love. I yeah. want to see this. Never. I never understood the fascination regarding Bob Marley. Just never got it. I, I think like a lot of it's just the the pot people liked. You know, pop uh, culture. It's like. Well, I don't know enough about. Like, I like to see biographies, and Anthony does just to learn more about. Like even like that Leonard Bernstein movie. It's like well, you learn a little about this person. <laughs> Did you see the trailer from Adam Webb? No, so I, I think this is in the, the Sony verse, Spider Man verse, I guess, whatever universe Venom exists. I think it looks terrible. I had no idea of his coming out till the trailer came out. I never heard anybody talk about it, but it looked awful. It's like, it looks like the movie equivalent of Batwoman. Should we, should we watch uh, the trailer? You don't have to watch it. Oh, I think I did watch this on a show I was on, and it looked awful and boring yes i did oh no i'm not watching that <laughs> <laughs> it's a lady superhero oh yeah because they're like all ladies uh, can yeah. we please stop with this this is what i was thinking of when i was <laughs> I'm what what are the movies i watched uh this year old oh it's not really old two movies uh, a couple years old i guess uh it's the three five five uh, that was that action spy movie with Jessica Chastain and uh, Diane Kruger, I think is the name, and Lupita, I can never say her last name, and uh, which I'm caught from uh, Spain, what's her name? Sophia, no, why am I blanking on her name? I can't remember her name, blanking on her. But it's ridiculous. It's, it's, even the critics hated it. I was like, this is a uh, instance in which the critics actually got it right. <laughs> Well, this one just is just, it's too many women. Um, it, it's its basically they took the woke formula and just took it to its ultimate end. It's like all women. And I, I why, and look, it's coming out on Valentine's Day. Oh, so I guess you're supposed to take your date. <laughs> or or maybe they're, they're, maybe they're poo-pooing Valentine's Day all together, together and they're doing this Galentine's thing where it's just ladies being awesome oh. and empowered together, single ladies. About yeah. to save uh, a couple girls, they they might break up at the end of the film. <laughs> like <laughs> there is a lot of breakups on Valentine's Night. The first female-led Spider-Man spinoff is coming, and we're here for it. No, we're not. It's awful. I don't want to see that. You sing loud, I sing louder. I don't know what that is. A uh, monolith. I'll have to look what that one that? up lately. It looks interesting, but I'll. It does, let's see. Monolith is a low-budget sci-fi thriller um, about a headstrong journalist whose investigative podcast uncovers a strange artifact, an alien conspiracy, and the lies at the heart of her own story. I mean, yeah, this looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Should we watch the trailer? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it in my own time. Oh. Yeah, we got a lot of movies to go through here. Oh, so. really? Oh, we're just I, well, we're February? only in February. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, how am I supposed to? <laughs> uh, Camp Pleasant Lake. Oh, that's uh, Friday the 13th uh, prequel. Prequel, okay. Um... Dune, that's what I'm looking for. Dune Part 2. It's, Dune it's Part 2. Great. I hope it does well because. Uh, Dene Vunu, if I say his name's talking about a third movie, maybe even a fourth. Like he keeps talking about more and more movies. I'm like, oh, I'll I'll watch them. Spaceman. Hmm. Cabrini Kung Fu Panda Kung Fu 4. Panda two. <laughs> or four. <laughs> That's it. Uh, a quiet place day one. I only saw the first one, didn't say the second one. I like the first one. I don't know if the second one was any good. Are you talking about Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> no. <laughs> Every time I, I think about Kung Fu Panda, I think about the, um, you remember the spoof movies that came out about 15 years ago? 
Uh, there's like date movie and there's one called superhero movie. And yeah. all the jokes are just references. Like there, there's no setup punchline. It's just uh, uh, references. And so a uh, character comes out dressed as Kung Fu Panda goes, I'm Kung Fu Panda. And then it cut to something else. That's <laughs> it. I'm like, what? Where's the joke? It's awful, awful movie. <laughs> yeah. Love, Lies, and Bleeding. Never heard of that. American Dreamer. Um, wait, let me just scroll back up. This movie, Damsel, okay? It looks is the really kind of, low budget. <laughs> it looks very low budget poster. But, you know, it's the kind of thing where because we're so sick of woke crap like this uh, Spider Woman, Madam Web nonsense gross up there, mm -hmm. when that sometimes, like you said, people overreact. They knee jerk react. Now, this could be a great movie with a female lead that, who knows? Um it just says it's about a, it's a fantasy film. A new uh, a dutiful damsel agrees to marry a handsome prince, only to find that the royal family has recruited her as a sacrifice to repay an ancient debt. Thrown into a cave with a fire breathing dragon, she must rely on her wits and will to survive. And it stars Millie Bobby Brown from Stranger Things. Oh, okay, I see you now. And who knows that could be good it does look the poster looks very <laughs> it's netflix imaginary yeah that's, oh, that's like a, a horror movie yeah could be interesting oh the american society of magical negroes i've been here so about much that had potential he could have done something really clever and funny but it just looks so dumb and lame and offensive it's just it's it's weird to me too like i don't know if they mean to to do this but like the premise is like uh um there's a group of black people who assign a quote-unquote magical negro to white people to make them uncomfortable and the main star of this the guy is this very thin uh guy fit and feminine looking dude very light skin who's non-threatening and i'm like are, are you I don't think this movie's quite saying what you think it's saying. <laughs> this is like, yeah. it's like, oh, it's very weird. It's like the only way black people are non-threatening. I think they say they think the only way blacks are non-threatening is if they're effeminate and like skin. I don't know if that's intentional, but at the same time, I, I think there are some people who are like, actually, I do feel more comfortable around black people that look like that. <laughs> Uh, I just want to show you this is the movie I would like to see. Can you read it? Magical Knitters. <laughs> yeah. I, I did. I made a meme. The American Society of Magical Knitters. Oh, you made that. Oh, nice. I made this. <laughs> -na -na. Somebody make this movie. <laughs> this <is not> <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. This movie needs to be made. Who will step up? <laughs> okay. Um, how do I go back to this one? Oh, there we go. Mark Wahlberg, Arthur and the King. An unexpected encounter. An unlikely bond. An unforgettable adventure. Based on the incredible true story. Know. It might be. I mean, I haven't seen some of the movies he's come out recently, but I know they've looked good and got some good reviews. Like um, the one he just, the family one, I think Critical Drinker uh, put out a video recommended, or somebody in, in the pop culture sphere run said that movie's very good. But he also did a movie, uh, Father Ted. I didn't see it. I don't know if it's any good. It looked very good. And so it seems like Mark Wahlberg's choosing a lot of good movies. I assume, again, I haven't seen these movies personally, but uh, it does seem like he's making some good choices. It's about him and the dog, guys. An adventure <laughs> racer adopts a stray dog named Arthur to join him in an epic endurance race. He just takes this. It's based on a true story. He takes the dog with him on the whole epic endurance race. Uh, basically like one of these uh, Iron Man kind of things around the world. And we should watch this trailer. It's got a dog in it. Well, we don't have to <laughs> 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 Bookmark that for later. Yeah. Kevin, movie about a dog? I'll watch that. Me too. <laughs> Have you seen all the Airbud movies, Karen? Look, 
Woke, woke Hollywood, they're like putting women in everything to try to win me over as an audience member, and it's actually repelling me. But if they put a dog in everything, <laughs> just dog swap it, dog swap it, I'd be there. Ghostbusters <laughs> with dogs, yeah, sign me the up. Dog father, the, the first all dog cast of Spider Man, I'm there. Why do that? I don't want to see all girl cast of Spider Man, I want to see an all dog cast of Spider Man. <laughs> <clears throat> Femme, seduction is revenge. Okay. Dogman, what's that about? Wait, is that Kevin Spacey in that next one? Yeah, it is Kevin Spacey. He's back. I've been waiting for, I was wondering when they were going to, because you know they were going to bring him back. Uh, of course. Well, he wasn't at Tucker Carlson. Video was so weird. It's so like, creepy. Why would you do that, Tucker? Like, guess people are going to think things about you now. Guess what Dogman is about? <laughs> hmm. What, Dogs. What could it be? All right. Boy, so you're going to see at least two movies. At least two movies. <laughs> A boy bruised by life finds his salvation through the love of his dogs. That looks good. Oh. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Oh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> so, uh, so Winnie, I didn't see the first. I looked pretty bad. But Winnie the Pooh is in public uh, domain. And uh, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, there's been a lot of people talking about how the Steamboat Willie. Uh, oh, you never heard of this? No, this is like a horror movie? It's it's campy. It's really ridiculous. I haven't seen it, but the trailer is just really campy because they can do anything now with uh, Winnie, Winnie the, Pooh. the Pooh. But yeah, since... Uh, Steamboat Willie version of Mickey Mouse is in the public domain now. Um, there, are, there are horror movies planned for this, and there's games, horror games and stuff. It's always horror, which is a weird thing people always go to first. But something I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about uh, Peter Pan, that went into uh, the public domain the same day that Steamboat Willie did. And not a lot of people are talking about that, but I'm curious to see how many movies and games and stuff we're going to start seeing now with Peter Pan in it. Wow. This is why I use Betty Boop in our intro video. It's in the public domain. It's a little Ghost... frozen. Uh, what do you know. think? Are you excited? No. Bill Murray's back. Yeah, no, but I just can't get excited for these newer Ghostbusters. I, I mean, Ghostbusters Afterlife is okay. I mean, but I just can't. I, just, I mean, I'm sure I'm it'll not... be an okay movie, but I just can't really get excited by it because it just... A lot of them just seem to be redoing the first movie, following very yeah. similar beats. That's what you know the Afterlife did, and I, I just I, I can't help but wonder if they had, for Ghostbusters two. As much as I love Ghostbusters two, it is inferior to the first one. But I just can't help but wonder if that movie and the sequels would have been better if they took the events of the first Ghostbuster movie more seriously. Because the whole joke of the Ghostbusters part two is that they saved the world in the first one. But now they're relegated to performing at children's birthday parties. Like that's a whole joke, and it ends up setting up um, them to follow the same beats as they did in the Ghostbusters one. But if they had treated the events of the Ghostbusters one more seriously, then I think that would have opened more possibilities because now the entire world knows that ghosts exist. Like mm -hmm. that would change everything. How many religions would be confirmed in that? Like what would government's responses do to, or what would that be? Uh, given that there are these potential threats that could come about anytime. I know that broadens the scope maybe more than what can be handled in a two hour movie, but I think you could get a lot of interesting ideas if they just fully embrace that. And I'd wish they'd do that here. Maybe they will, but I don't know. Ever in the chat's kind of agreeing with you, Kandra, new ideas, not rehashing old material, uh, daybreak oblivion, all caps, no more ghostbusters movies. <laughs> Arn Arnarla, Widaga, Arnawa, Arnawa, Widaga. I've got to pr practice this alone <laughs> off camera. So, because I've seen you several times and I love your name. It's beautiful. I wish I could say it. <clears throat> um, it says, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and Davina Duckworth. Hello. I love your new avatar for 2024, oh, yeah. Davina. Davina says, I'm done with Ghostbusters. Yeah, Kevin, same thing. Stop going back to the wall, to the well. Okay, Godzilla, X Kong, the new empire. I don't know how 
anyone could get excited for this after seeing Godzilla minus one. It's like, I don't know if I could go back to goofy, silly Godzilla after seeing the masterpiece that is Godzilla minus one. This is movie just looks so silly. I just laughed when seeing the uh, shot <laughs> in the trailer of Godzilla and King Kong running side by side, like it's this eighties action buddy cop film. It just looks silly like the last one was really silly and over the top i was more forgiving of that because that came out right as i think what is that 2021 i think so we're still in the pandemic i put that in quote whatever was going on at that time and people were just looking for escapism turn off the brain so i, I gave it a pass but i'm just now i'm like i'm not looking forward to that we're moving into april the first omen they're doing another omen movie I mean, they're doing this with horror, too. They keep going mm -hmm. back to the, the well. Yes, they keep going back Friday to the same 13. stuff. It's just more of the this same. Is a, this is a weird poster. The feeling that the time for doing something has passed. A comedy. That's a long by time. Arno. <laughs> it's a weird poster and a weird title. <laughs> this is a real movie, not an ad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, it worked. It got my attention. It's like, what mm -hmm. is this? Uh, is an American comedy film and let's see it doesn't I don't know I can't see any, I can't find anything about what it's about hmm. oh here it is Anne a morose New Yorker in her 30s feels stuck in all areas of her life to her dismay the years have gone by quickly in her long-term casual BDSM relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know your problem. Or Anne. Something? <laughs> I think I know your problem, man. I think you okay. So let's see. So she's morose and feels stuck. The years have gone by quickly in her, let's see, long-term casual BDSM relationship low-level corporate job and quarrelsome jewish family as she begins to feel increasingly alienated she wrestles with herself and her relationships i who's the market for like who are they who's this movie for other other woke 30 something women single in new york who are unhappy with life and want to commiserate with someone on screen <laughs> uh it's a lot of them so i'm sure the movie will do well Civil War. Civil War. So you saw that. I'm sure you've talked about this, right? No. What is this? You haven't seen this? This is so. This is a twenty four. Um, it's a, basically a movie about civil war breaking out between like militias. You know, tie back to what I was saying earlier about uh, redneck militias versus the government. So the trailer starts off that they say that California and Texas secede, and I'm like, T California seceding? Really? You really think California would secede against go against the government? Seriously? silly that's ridiculous yeah but i it, mean it, i goofy. it but i'm looking i think i might watch this i mean it's sort of post-apocalyptic in a way right hmm. in a way yeah. in a way we might not have to wait long to see the real thing happen yeah. okay. um okay may of 2024 back to black there's a uh um amy winehouse movie coming out a biopic um fall guy what is that ryan that's, gosling uh, ryan gosling he plays a stunt man who uh i think he gets roped into actual uh having to be a spy or some kind of secret agent i think it's based isn't based like an old uh yeah it's based on the uh show from like 70s that's for my time but if here on the right if with ryan reynolds and john krasinski and Phoebe Waller Bridge. It's about imaginary friends of some kind of fantasy. Are they trying to do a Drop Dead Fred? <laughs> Just remake Drop Dead Fred. Oh, Garfield's coming out another one? Oh, gosh. Garfield. Really? Who's demanding this? Who's yeah. like, give me more Garfield? <laughs> Is Bill Murray still doing the voice? I heard he got tricked into doing the first Garfield. Did you hear that? Oh, I think that that does sound familiar. That of some contractual thing where he had to be in it. He, you know. I don't know. This is this looks. It just doesn't look good, though. Why? Why do this? Leave it alone, Chris oh, Pratt. Looks even worse. Oh, Chris Pratt. Uh, I love Chris Pratt, but 
Uh, is this a good choice? Uh, oh, oh, the anime movie also stars Samuel Jackson. What in Garfield? Samuel Jackson. What's happened? <laughs> Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I, I will, I've liked these new uh, Mad Planet Max. Of the movies. So I'm looking at Furiosa. That could be good. It looked like they used too much CGI for Furiosa. And uh, I still would have liked to have seen more of Mad Max, but they're shifting to Furiosi. Furiosa. But I think it's still directed by uh, Witch McCall, who directed the original in Fury Road. So it could be good. Ballerina. It's a ballerina. Is Mawata, of, who is that? Ballerina with okay. a bunch of guns around her. Okay. Have you heard of this? Oh. I have, no. A John Wick story. Oh, oh. spin off. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have heard of that. Yeah. Why, though? Why? Why do we need a young female <laughs> assassin? Let me read it again. A young female assassin seeks revenge against the people who killed her family. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard anybody talk about the John Wick television show, The Continental. I wonder if it's any good. It's There's a John Wick just, television show? Yeah, he's not in it, but the the guy who plays the, uh, the guy who's in charge of The Continental. That's the Al Swearingen from Deadwood. Yeah, I know the actor, but I'm trying to think the character, what the character's name is. I'm blanking, but... He'll always be Al Swearingen to me. <laughs> Ian McShane, that's that actor's name. The Watchers. You can't see them, but they can see you. <laughs> the Peeping Toms. Uh, it's an upcoming American supernatural horror film. Oh, it's an M. Night, it's an M. Night Shyamalan. No. Yeah. People are still giving him money to make movies? <laughs> yes. Give me some money. I'll make a movie. 28 year old artist Mina gets stranded in an expansive, untouched forest in Western Ireland. Upon finding shelter, she unknowingly becomes trapped alongside three strangers who are watched and stalked by mysterious creatures each night. Dakota what's going to be the stupid twist? Um, that uh, the, the three street, the okay, the three creatures who are stalking her, um, Throughout the whole movie, you think they're the bad guys, and then you find out they're the good guys, and that humans are the bad guys. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> There's just something like that. <laughs> or it's them from the future. I don't know. Or it's them from the future. <laughs> <Something. Yeah. laughs> it's going to be something dumb. It's going to piss me off, but I'm not going to watch it anyway. So, <laughs> Inside Out 2. I, I liked the first Inside Out. Never saw it. It's about if your emotions were depicted as individual creatures. Or entities. The bike riders. That I like the I like the poster art here. It, it's a callback to the 70s. Hmm, yeah. I don't know what that is about, but it looks good. Firebrand. What is that? Mm -hmm. That title doesn't match the image though. Right. Ooh. It's a historical drama. Um, it's, a, it's, it's based on the 2013 novel Queen's Gambit. The film focuses on Catherine Parr, the sixth and final wife of Henry VIII. Hmm. I would watch this one. It's a period film. Oh, it ends with us. Weird. Okay, I'll tell you about that. I know about this one. Because I was flying recently when I flew to Content House. Chrissy Meredith content house at the end of December. And whenever I'm flying, I just pick up whatever trash popular novel is in the bookstore at the library. I mean, at the library at the airport, I will go into the airport and pick up a book just for the plane. And I, this one is, I don't know anything about her other than the last time I flew somewhere. When I flew for Chrissy's wedding, I read another book by this woman, Colleen Hoover. And it was great. It's a quick read. I read it all like in two days or a day, the other one. And so this one, um, I recognize the name and, and here's the weird thing. A woman came over like someone who didn't work there at the airport bookstore. Women apparently love this, this author. 
And this woman came over and was like, oh, that one's so good. Have you read it? And just starts <laughs> talking to me. It was really funny. And I'm like, uh, no, I haven't. And, and do you work here? She's like, no, I just I love that one. <laughs> also, there was this funny thing that happened because Eva Max Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, was also uh... on display. And she saw me turn it up upside down i turned it over <laughs> i was about to ask you how hard was it for you to control yourself not to oh, throw i didn't it? control myself <laughs> i just turned it up so i was like oh and then she said tell me how you really feel i was like that book sucks and she's like does <laughs> she said does it i was like yeah have you read you know what it's about she said no this is a young younger younger woman too i said oh it's a, it's a book that supposedly teaches you how to be an anti-racist but it's really teaching you how to be a horrible racist to think it's okay and she started <laughs> laughing and and then she started telling me she, the this Colleen Hoover book was right next to it. She said, "Well, this one's good," and we start, and so I ended up buying it. And it was I read it all in two days on the way to Content House, and the first day I was there. And and it's a great trashy, you know, it's a it's a woman who falls in love with this guy who turns out not to be great for her. There's a love triangle of sorts. It's just it's just nonsense filler. Do you know what I mean? It's not a great novel. It's just it's entertaining and if you're looking for a travel airport book it's sort of like mm -hmm. junk food like a like a slice of pizza junk food for for the plane this was great so then get this i land i'm coming back from content house and i get i pick up uh i, I stop at the bookstore i'm like even though i'm not flying anymore i was thinking let me just grab another book i'm right here with at the bookstore again and another woman a second woman is like, I'm looking through the books and they have the Colleen Hoover stuff on display. She's like, oh, have you read this? This random stranger starts telling me about this. I guess it's a, a prequel to this one called It Begins With Us. She said, oh, you should buy this one. So I'm like, okay, so I did. And then, um, oh, wait, no, that was, I know, I know why I bought it. I bought it in the airport in New York in the Poconos before coming back. So I was going to read it on the plane. So I buy the, the next one, right? So then, so a second woman had recommended it. Then I'm on the plane. I bring out the second book. I'm reading the, the prequel. And the girl next to me on the flight, another young woman, these are all young women, this young woman who's going to uh, Texas for the first time starts telling me about the, she's like, oh, I love Colleen Hoover. And <laughs> Is this like the new me, Fifty Shades of Grey? No, because it's not explicitly, you know, BDSM or anything, but but it's popularity but with young women. The popularity is huge with young women. And this third young woman I could tell was kind of woke adjacent. She starts saying to me, you know, I think it's a little bit problematic because she um, depicts women getting into relationships sometimes with abusive men and younger women like myself could get the wrong message from that. And, you know, so she was a little bit concerned about it, but we had a good conversation anyway. All of this long, sorry, rambling story to tell you that as I feel like, you know, when you're an older person, and you discover something the kids are into. I'm like, oh, the kids love Colleen Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> so will so, you be seeing this movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Okay, maybe maybe like a lifetime kind of movie when it cut when it's finally on television, you know, and you're just you're eating if you're eating something a guilty indulgence and then you watch a guilty indulgence TV show, then yes, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Somebody says, wait a minute. Nerdy girl says, if you want some good books for the plane, Ruth Ware's books are great. They're mysteries, so I wouldn't call them trashy, but they're page turn. Oh, nerdy girl. I think I read one of hers on a plane too. I gotta look her up and see. Yeah, when I say trashy, I don't mean trashy in terms of, oh, it's very sexual or anything. I just mean, I, I mean, trashy and kind, kind of like junk food. It's it's just, it's good. It's entertaining and it's it's popcorn. It's it, it's not it's not a steak. It's not a filet mignon. It's not, it's not like, oh, this is an excellent piece of literature. You have to read this. But it's for, it's really tasty. And you, and you can, for a snack, you can read it very quickly, you know. And it'll hold your attention. So that's what I mean. <laughs> Sorry, that was long. <laughs> oh, good. I enjoyed it. Speak of me, four, they made three of those? What? I didn't even know that. And Twisters. Twisters. <laughs> oh. They're out of ideas. Oh. They're out of ideas. <laughs> More tornadoes like, <laughs> oh, this is bad. Uh, 
Deadpool 3. I don't know what to make of Deadpool 3. It might be good. Well, first of all, it's now Disney, so I don't know if it's going to be as R-rated. Or I don't know if it's going to be R-rated at all, but I don't know if it's going to be as raunchy in the humor as previous ones. But I don't know. It seems to me like Disney is trying to milk the Brian Singer X-Men versions of characters as much as they can before they reboot X-Men again, because Hugh Jackman is back in this one. Uh, I know uh, some of the other characters have been in some of the other recent Marvel uh, movies. They've popped up at the end or surprise scenes and stuff like that. So it just seems to me like they're, they're trying to get as much more money they can. One last time out of these characters were rebooting, which in my opinion, they should have already rebooted X-Men. I think that's how you keep Marvel interesting, assuming they don't you know, put all woke stuff in it. But I think you should have gone immediately into the, x-men stuff instead of doing the marvels and doing all these c and d list characters that nobody cares about no. yeah i don't i don't care about it at all yeah <laughs> so what is I, I don't know what is it that sounds familiar i mean i think another movie was named that gina Gershon is in it Kate Blanchett, oh, Jamie Lee Curtis, Kevin Hart. What? Bobby Lee? It's a weird cast. <laughs> Bobby Lee's in it. <laughs> a feature film based on the popular video game. Oh, it is. It's based uh, on the video game. That's why it's familiar. It's the same font. I, I've played. I've played this game. Did you ever play this game? It's a great game. No. The popular video game set on the abandoned fictional planet of Pandora, where people search for a mysterious relic. That's the Avatar planet. Planet Pandora. alien another alien yeah i don't know what the, i haven't seen any images i have no very little details about about this one so i don't know if it's going to be any good uh these last few alien movies haven't been very good so i don't know you know what you can really do with this franchise now but maybe if they got someone who has a uh, really good story we'll, we'll see but hopefully it's better than the last couple because those were awful and three <laughs> and alien versus predator what's this craven the hunter that's a Spider-Man a villain, but there's no Spider-Man oh. in this movie. It's just him, which I'm curious how that's going to do, given that Mobius, who is a Spider-Man villain, had his own solo movie that nobody saw. And so I, I think this one's probably going to bomb, too. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice 2? Why? I don't, yeah, because they want that sweet, sweet nostalgia money. <laughs> and, and that's all it's it like is. Gen nostalgia. X and millennials, like, I guess our generation is... Uh, we're the ones keeping these uh, reboots alive because uh, all Transformers, these are really geared towards us. Yes, that's another one. Transformers one. That's nostalgia money. I'm not sure how much uh, these are converting over to a younger crowd. I don't think Star Wars and other stuff is as popular with them as it is for us as adults, and certainly as it was for us as children. But this one, I, I don't know because I was thinking about how how many sequels to movies that came out more than ten years prior have been good. There's very few. I can't yeah. think of very many. No, not very many at all. I mean, so Top Gun was good. Top yes, Gun. Top Gun. I agree. But that's but it. But like, <laughs> I can't think of very many. And this one's been over 30 years. I'm like, I don't, I'm not thinking this is going to be very, very good. But I, I'll probably see it because I'm a mark. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to give over my money. <laughs> Let's see. Wolves. Uh, not wolves. Wolves. Uh, this is Brad Pitt, George Clooney. Follows two lone wolf fixers who are assigned to the same job. Joker two. I don't. I don't know. Wait, hmm? Joker two. Wow. Yeah, they're making another Joker movie, which uh, first one was I, I it was okay, but I didn't rave a, about it. I like, like a lot of people did. One. I just didn't buy him as the Joker. I like Walking Phoenix. Like, as, if this character wasn't called Joker, I'd be fine with it. But as the Joker, he never came across mm -hmm. as the Joker. The Joker is crazy, but he's also very smart because he'd have to be. And uh, if he's Batman's number one villain, then he's has to have some intelligence and this one just didn't seem very smart and he was very reactive he didn't have like a strategic plan or anything it was just reaction he just decides to shoot his gun you know take somebody out randomly and it's just uh, didn't work didn't quite work for me but uh lady gaga is uh, harley quinn in this one so 
I'm curious to see what her performance is going to be because I don't think I've seen her in any movies. I can't rate her as an actor. Wasn't she in that movie with Bradley, Bradley Cooper? Cooper? Yeah, that the one I see the singing one that got nominated for Oscar, I think. Yeah. The Terrifier Three. <laughs> is that a Rob or, Zombie movie? What is it? It looks um, kind of like the guy who was in the Rob Zombie films. I, don't know. I started to watch of one of these because I do like horror, but um, no, it's not Rob Zombie. Yeah. It's this is a Terrifier Three is an upcoming Christmas slasher film. Damien Leone. Yeah. I started to watch the first one and then I just didn't finish it. I don't know if I should, but if there's a horror movie fan who thinks I should, let me know. I like November the poster. Gladiator. Yeah, I like Gladiator Two and I don't know. Is this Wicked? The the first time they're doing a Wicked movie? Didn't they already do Wicked? I thought they did. Even more Wicked. I'm confused. I thought they did a Wicked movie, and I I haven't seen it. No, I, I is this the first one? I go. Oh, I guess so. Could have sworn they did do one. So, I think we're just thinking of the actual musical. Huh. Uh, Universal's film adaptation of the Tony Award-winning Broadway musical, which is based on the 1995 novel, was first announced all the way back in 2016. Um, in 2021, so and so were cast. In 2022, John M. Chu. Uh, Tease more details. So I guess yeah, it's coming out in 2024. Oh, it stars Ariana Grande. Oh, oh, you know why I know about this movie? Because the guy who's in it, there was some kind of drama. The actor who's in it, who's sort of an unknown, a ginger, he left his <laughs> wife and newborn baby for Ariana Grande. He was having an affair oh. with her, and I think she's a trash person. And she what is was it having about her. That makes these men go crazy. Pete Davidson went crazy over her. Uh, let me see. Ethan Slater, that's his name. He's a Broadway actor. And so his wife has supported him all the way through his struggling as an actor and his struggling career, right? Here, look, here he is. See this ugly ginger? That here? guy? Yes, that the one, guy? Well, I should yeah. be surprised if she dated Pete Davidson. <laughs> but yes. Wow. And so he goes off and, and his wife has a newborn baby. And he goes off, finally gets his big break, right? And his wife, who's supported him this whole time, that he was struggling. And then he goes off and what does he do? Uh, leaves his wife for this actress, Ariana Grande. Wow. He looks like a botched clone of Carrot Top. Yeah. Um, and he says he's dating uh, he's dating Ari Ariana Grande. Yeah, her new boyfriend. Look up these articles. Um, oh, look. Ariana Grande is a strange, uh, gets blasted by Ethan's estranged wife. I can't read it because there's an ad in the way. But, but I think it's disgusting. Oh, you know what he did before this? He was like the voice of SpongeBob or something on Broadway. Wow. She's Here, got look at some this. Weird taste in dudes. That's him on the left. <laughs> look at that dweeb. And 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 I'm sorry, I wouldn't be so critical of his appearance if he weren't a trash human. I can't stand what he did to his wife. That's his wife there. Yeah. And also the fact that apparently, like Ariana Grande was like following his wife on Instagram and liking some of her pictures and stuff, while at the same time trying to get in her in her husband's pants. You know what I mean? Like that fake false friend. And I'm sure the wife was thinking, oh, well, I don't have anything to worry about because Ariana's liking my pictures and stuff. Like, I guess we're friends. <laughs> like, Yikes. you know, um, so I'm sorry. This is all this, you see what Carrie, how I make up my mind about things. I will not be seeing wicked because I'm not going to go support the work <laughs> of these two adulterers. And um, <laughs> this guy who just abandoned his new baby and you know, but you're better off without him, honey, because turns out he's a narcissist. <laughs> well, that, that relationship won't last long. She'll she'll be no, on to the next weird looking dude. Of course not. Yeah, what a scumbag says hum yeah, that's the only reason I'm making fun of his looks. I mean, otherwise, you know, you know, a person's look is it it's entirely sometimes dependent on who they are as a person. 
So. Yeah, you factor uh, it in. It influences. <laughs> you know. See this ugly ginger. <laughs> 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 the ginger age is strong of you. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Let's go back to the movie. I went on a tangent there. <laughs> <laughs> Home wrecker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and we're finishing it up with December. We can look Mufasa. forward to Mufasa, the Lion King, and Nosferatu. I thought people hated the uh, live action Lion King movie that came out a few years ago. I thought they yeah. did too. Or... They're making a prequel for it. And I'm curious if they're going to use the AI version of James Earl Jones for this because you heard about him selling his voice for AI purposes. Oh. Yeah. I, think I forgot about that. So they can continue to make Darth Vader movies and television shows forever. Uh, Which Disney will. Put them in <laughs> Winnie no the Pooh horror will. movies. <laughs> <laughs> you could put the, anything AI in, in the public domain. Just it's, You could do a mashup. Okay, what is this <laughs> Nosferatu? I don't know. Lily Rose Depp. I don't know any of these actors. Um, Bill yeah. Skarsgård. I would watch this, though. I mean... Maybe. Let me see images. I don't want to just see a font. Yeah, me too. But something I noticed with all these movies gone over, it's like it doesn't look like there's very many comedy movies, which I guess shouldn't be too surprising because we've talked about the lack of comedy movies mm -hmm. uh, as recent. But especially, I guess, in theater, like if we were to find a list of comedies putting up on a streaming service, I'm, I'm sure we'd probably find a decent amount. But movie theaters, maybe... Uh, they're just not seeing the return. That maybe it's not worth it to put out comedies, which I would think they would because I prefer to watch a comedy in a theater because I like laughing with everybody else. That influences the way you. Right, it gets you to go stuff. to the theater. Yeah. So like Beverly Cops Four, that's gone straight to streaming. They didn't put that in here. I'm surprised, but Beverly Cops Four is going to be on Netflix next year or this year, and uh, we'll see how funny it is. Uh, talk about a movie that's uh, been made well, 30 years later. But uh, we'll see. Well, oh man, I, I blanked on what I was gonna add. Never mind. I guess it wasn't important. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll move on then. Um, that's it. Okay, that's twenty twenty four. That's what's coming out. Oh, comedies and theaters. I was gonna say, I've been watching a lot of older. Like you mentioned at the very beginning of this episode, you've been watching a lot of older movies and enjoying them and. I watched this year around uh, Christmas, the Christmas season, December. I, I, I was watching a lot of just sort of mediocre Christmas movies that I had never seen. I watched one with Eddie Murphy and David Allen Greer played Black Santa. And is this the new one that came was, out? Um, or is this old? I think so. Movie? This one might I know have he been just new. came out with a Christmas movie that I wasn't sure if it was any good. It looked like maybe it could be good, but I don't know. It's so hard to tell. Let me see. Um, what was it called? It it just came out. I think it did. I, yeah, it just Candy Cane Lane. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. saw so I saw Candy Cane Lane. Um, no, it's not good. But there's good <laughs> little there's good scenes. Dave Allen Greer's hilarious. At the, he's only at the very end, you know. But it's not it's not a good movie. No. Um, but I I it was Christmas time, so I was like, I'm just gonna put on this stuff in the background while I'm getting work done and like, uh, wrapping presents and things like that. And um, I put on a Daddy's Home too. <laughs> Have you seen this? This one no, was actually good. Never heard of it. It's Will Ferrell and Marky Mark, Mark Wahlberg. I had never seen Daddy's Home, the original. Now I have to go back and watch it. But I figured this one's set at Christmas time, the second one. So it's it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah it's Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell and Mel Gibson plays Mark Wahlberg's dad and uh, John Lithgow plays. Um, plays a, a Will Ferrell's dad and it's just a silly it's a Will Ferrell movie you know what you're gonna get it's a lot of silly funny laughs and and I don't see a lot of movies like that coming out anymore that was 2017 that movie hmm. but, anyway. yeah there's, there's not a lot of comedy because I, I always tell people like I ask them think about classic comedy movies 
if you think about movies that comedy movies that came out between I don't know nineteen let's say sixty five to nineteen ninety five, if I asked you to think about some classic movies from comedies from that time period, you could think of tons. Like you, yeah, it's been quite a while naming them. But if you think from like I don't know ninety five to today, I would kind of struggle to name more than like ten classic comedies. I can name a lot of comedies, but just not ones that I, I think are are classics. And this started like way before the woke stuff. So I'm like what's going on with comedies and like, there's something going on. And certainly the political correctness stuff doesn't help. But even before that, there was something that was lacking in these comedies that wasn't making them all timers. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, but I'd like to see more comedies until then. I'm just mm -hmm. going to keep watching old ones like mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Um, uh Somebody says they're planning release the McCracken. Says I think they're planning a third daddy zone. <laughs> wow, so silly. Anyway, that's funny. Of course they are. <laughs> of course they are. Um, thank you guys for hanging out with us. We are heading into our third hour here, so we're gonna wrap this up. I'm shocked. I didn't think we were. Gonna, remember, we said we might just do a short one, like an hour. Yeah, <laughs> that went out the window. Yeah, yeah. So it's almost a three hour video, Mr. Chris. And, but it was, it was good to have you back. Everyone's missed you. I've missed you so much. I'm missing I missed y'all. Thank y'all. I've seen all these nice comments in the chat. Making black man blush. <laughs> Therese says, this was fun. Welcome back, MC. Have a great week, everyone. Well, thank good. you. It's almost time for me to go home, says Kevin. <laughs> okay. If it's your first time here, uh, please hit like and subscribe if you like the video. And Starting next week, hopefully by Monday, I'll be in the new program studio. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate every person who hangs out in the chat, in the comments. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so at um, Subscribestar or Patreon Locals or here at YouTube. And we will see you on Monday. I've got a, a live interview on Monday. I'll be announcing that later today. And um, and uh, yeah, welcome back, MC. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, chat. Love you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.